Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Plastow Board of Selectmen meeting for July 13th, 2020. Um, I'd like to call this meeting to order at 6.30 p.m. And Beth, may I have a roll call, please? Select Chair, Ms. Hart. Here. Select Vice Chair, Mr. Townsend. Here. Select Mr. Tishka. Here. Select Mr. Blaine. Here. Select Mr. DeRoche. Here. And note for the record, Tom Manchin, Mr. Pearson. All right, thank you so much. Um, would everyone rise to the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. Um, so our first agenda item um, is to approve the meeting minutes from um, June 15th. Thank you. So may I have a so motion, motion on the to floor? Approve the meeting minutes of June 15th. Okay, thank you. Um, is there a second on that? I second a motion. Okay, thank you, John. Um, is there any discussion on the minutes? No. All right, seeing none, I'll take a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? All right, the motion carries um, 5 0 0. Okay, um, the next item on the agenda is public comment. And um, I don't believe there is anyone here for public comment at this point. So um, we're gonna just jump right into our agenda items. So I would like to, oh, go ahead, Jams. I apologize, go ahead. Just a question regarding public comment. Sure. Um, will there be a time when people can come in? In person? Uh, uh, it's my understanding, and I'll check this with Mark, but it's my understanding they can come in now at this point because I believe we've allowed up to 50 people as long as they're socially distant. So, you know, there's plenty of room here to, to have several people come in for public comment, so everybody is welcome. If they're not comfortable in coming in, um, we I still have my phone with me. They can call in or um, they can email Beth by Thursday afternoon, and that's not a problem. So, good point. All right, thanks for bringing that up. You're welcome. All right, so um, I would like to introduce um, Lou from Cascade Carding. He was very gracious enough to come in and um, give us a presentation on his recycling cart. So thank you so much for coming, and I'm gonna leave the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. I appreciate it. Yeah. So I just wanted to uh, introduce myself. My name is Lou Russell with Cascade Cart Solutions. Um, do you prefer to me to take this off? You can, because I know I can't breathe or talk with yeah. one on, and you're far enough away from all of us, so you're fine. Perfect. So um, I just wanted to um, say thank you again for the invite, and I just wanted to touch upon our, our carts and maybe, you know, in the next 6 to 12 months that you might be looking to uh, move forward with a cart program within mm -hmm. town. So it was a good opportunity for me to come in, kind of show you, uh, teach you a couple uh, nuances about carts and uh, we can go from there so it's perfect timing actually it is yes. great timing <laughs> oops so, should i use the remote um beth do you, is is it the remote that he needs to use or oh the, or the laptop is it pay um the arrow key or yeah i think just the arrow keys oh, so probably page down i mean there you go, oh, to there the right. you go. Okay. perfect All right. okay so uh, i just wanted to let you know give you some history regarding my organization, I work for Cascade Engineering. We're out of Grand Rapids, Michigan. It was founded by Fred Keller back in 1973. And uh, one of our core products is uh, making um, carts, uh, amongst other, other things. So we are uh, a national woman business owned, recognized facility or uh, organization. Um, so Fred Keller is the gentleman in the back row in the middle. And then his daughter, um, um, uh, oh my goodness. Uh, his daughter. His daughter is, <laughs> is in the front. And uh, so she's now running the organization. So what Great. a slip that was. So, and then I just wanted to show you, here, here's some of our business units that we uh, have. So it's not only Cascade Cart Solutions, but we're involved in several other organizations uh, with uh, automotive and um, uh, we make RFID tags and uh, Decade products with agricultural type services. So it's just not one faceted business. Yeah. And these are some of the components and parts that we make. Um, and again, being in Grand Rapids, Michigan, 
It's heavily involved with the, the, the auto industry. And these are just some of our customers that we have. And so our team typically, so I'm the sales manager that covers New England. Uh, Matt Mays is the national director, so I roll up to Matt and Scott Downer, who's our national sales director. Uh, Joanne Perkins is my vice president and GM. And then Richard Palacios is our uh, director who manages the team for the assembly and distribution. Okay. So now we'll get into the really the nuts and bolts. a picture of one of our streets. Right, the, <laughs> the uh, nuts and bolts of the why you, you brought me in. So obviously, you've probably seen this during the floor, during the collection, um, you get dogs chewing through the bags, you know, and it causes some unsightly, um, you know, issues throughout the community. And again, with recycling, you got newspaper getting, th you know, blown throughout the whole uh, the streets, and then you have to have your manpower by picking up the litter, obviously, again, causing more labor and time and can, you know, uh, in regards to spending time picking up recyclables versus just having it in a nice uh, container. Uh, wind blown trash. <coughs> and again, from an operational standpoint, it's not as productive either because the trash people, especially during this pandemic with COVID, you don't necessarily want them touching the carts, touching the trash barrel, touching the bags, again, other hidden dangers with needles and bags and stuff like that. So again, converting to a CART program does make sense to help reduce not only from the collection side, but from overall aesthetics of the uh, town. And I just wanted to show you a couple uh, pictures of an automated truck, which is on the bottom and the top right, and then the semi-manual lift system, which is in the top left side. So with the automated collection, obviously the, the driver does not have to get out of the truck. He mm -hmm. just extends an arm that grabs the cart, dumps it into the hopper, and it can be a split body truck. So it could be one truck picking up both trash and recycling, okay. or it could be just one dedicated truck for trash only, or dedicated truck for recycling. So it all depends on what would work for your community and obviously your collection um, vendor, uh, what type of vehicle that they would want to use. And then semi-manual is, again, they st the trash company, uh, the laborer would still have to touch the cart, but he would have to bring it up to the cart, uh, bring it up to the truck, and press, push a lever, and it will manually dump uh, the cart. But again, trying to minimize, trying to minimize touches with uh, any exposure, obviously an automated side load is certainly more productive, because uh, again, the, tr the driver doesn't have to get out of the truck, and then he doesn't have to touch the cart either. So there's just a couple examples of um, the universal cart. Can I yes, ask sir? a question? Um, how, how standard are these carts in terms of different types of vehicles being able to pick them or you, or you be able to utilize them? Sure, so we make a universal cart. Um, so it can be uh, utilized through an automated side load truck where the grabber will grab the middle of the cart and dump it into the hopper. Or we have an inner pouch design. I brought a 32-gallon cart. Uh, so the semi-manual uh, lift system would actually pick up the cart from just underneath okay, this uh, yeah. lift. Yep. And then this is called a catch bar, where as it's tipping, as a little metal piece come out, comes out of the lifter, and it catches this lower grab bar so it doesn't throw the cart into the hopper of the truck okay. itself. Yeah. And uh, so then it will lower it back down. The, the work would bring it back to the curb. So you'd move on to the next so house. the question is, how standard are these? Uh, as we're going to be ne negotiating for a brand new trash uh, company to a sure. business, not knowing what kind of trucks they have or whatever, yeah. and, and whether what we would have to put a specific type of cart on our RFP to help right. them be applicable. So how standard are these? It's, they are extremely standard. Okay. It's, That's yeah, what I so, to yeah, it's, so it's ANSI, ANSI is the governing body that yep. is, is this um, safety codes. Yep. Um, and so we qualify, there's one of them's safety and one of them's more like the design. And we qualify for both for the North American automated side load or the semi-manual. It's a, you know, it's geared back to a universal cart. So in the North America, mainly in the United States, it's really 
two drivers, the semi-manual lift, which you see in the top left, and then also the automated, uh, which, which is, they're both used widely okay. throughout the U.S. Good, thank you. So, all right, and then, um, so then moving on, uh, we'll go to the next slide. So, oh, I, I'm sorry, did you have oh, a question? Oh, yeah. no. okay. okay. So then I just wanted to show you, you know, embracing the future of collections. Here's just, uh, I put down a couple. Uh, just south of us uh, in regards to what they implemented some type of cart program if it was recycling only or both trash and recycling um, So these were just a couple of the last uh, last year or so they've rolled uh, the curbside collection uh, or, or the carts into their curbside collection program So Lou I noticed when I read that that you had given a 64 gallon bin at no cost to the people in Waltham so that, that, that is work? not necessarily my organization. That was, that was the verbiage from the municipality telling the residents, all right, we're going to supply okay. the residents a 64-gallon cart, and moving forward, this is the new program. Okay. So it wasn't necessarily the literature okay. that I provided. All right, okay. <laughs> the municipality that was... I could only hope. <laughs> all right, okay. <laughs> so, but we could, I could, uh, I'll close uh, in my comments at the end of an avenue where you could potentially qualify okay, for great. some grant funding. Excellent. Um, so, okay. But that was a good question. So, and, and like I said, like for example, this slide, that was the information that Waltham rolled out to the residents, um, notifying them the new program and here's the start of it. This is what we're gonna do. Right. And they, they, they didn't do a page you throw type collection or it was just straight, here's a 64 gallon cart you need to put it out here, and we're going to pick it up. And that was um, for recycling. Okay. Well, then. So at Cascade, um, for our specific uh, district, we, we've made over 30 million carts um, since uh, 1989. So we have essentially about a $2 million uh, capacity. Uh, we just actually uh, got a brand new press in, which is very exciting. So hopefully we're going to be increasing that number. Um, so that's certainly very exciting. So some of our sizes that we carry, we carry a 32 gallon, which I brought with me. Yeah. We have a 35 gallon, a 64 gallon, and the larger container, 96 gallon, which is an equivalent to a half a yard. Excuse me. So um, during our, we have runs that we provide and we had some testing that we, we have an in-house testing facility that we do test our carts out. Um, just to stay ahead of the curve in regards to the ANSI requirements that we we have. So they, they will freeze this cart to, you know, minus uh, 40 degrees, raise it up 14 feet with 160 pounds in it, and drop it and see if it breaks. And they'll do that. And then they'll raise it up to 15 feet and 16 feet and see <coughs> how, how the durability of the, the cart, the material as it's coming off the presses, how it reacts. And they'll do a, um, with the drop test, the bottom wear test, the They'll test the wheels, like traveling 15 miles of dropping a wheel off the curb, just to try to keep the integrity of the cart itself. So we do all kinds of uh, testing in-house to ma make sure that you're getting a good product. So, so Lou, if, if a cart should get damaged, perhaps like in a, in a snowstorm where a plow would hit it or crack it or whatever, um, do you replace the damaged carts at no extra cost, or would that be an additional charge? We have a warranty, it's, oh, which right. is industry standard for a 10-year okay. non-prorated warranty. All right. But something where if a, a cart got hit by a plow, that unfortunately wouldn't be covered by warranty Would not, because it was not uh, right, okay. a workmanship right. uh, issue. It was right. it was struck by it's only workmanship vehicle, warranty. So. Okay, correct. Yeah. Alrighty, thanks. And that's be, industry standard. Yep. As okay. Well. But if we if that person were to get it replaced, would they have to come to Cascade to? Typically, that would be discussed amongst uh, with At your hauler board. or yeah. with the municipality if you have yeah. again. Um, Different municipalities have more crew versus no people uh, handling like the trash right. side. Right. So that would be ideally putting on the RFP or, or your contract saying if there needs to be uh, any type of delivery or swap or a change in size or repair, uh, broken lid that you needed to swap out, that would be handled through the vendor. Uh, and I'm going to guess we should be smart enough to keep a couple of these things extra, maybe at a public works garage, just to, to replace things if need be. But that can be part of the discussion later. And that right. would be, yeah. yeah. And what we do is 
Uh, there's no right or wrong answer in regards to how much inventory should you carry. Mm -hmm. um, typically, you know, the uh, 3,500 homes, you know, even if you have 50, you know, 75, and it all, it all kind of shuffles up during the, the, the process of okay. the assembly and distribution. Um, so it all depends on, you know, uh, what sizes that you are, what, what, what you're going to offer. Uh, my recommendation is if there's no um, requirement now in regards to they can throw anything out at the curb right now, you may want to stick to a 96 for trash, a 96 for recycling, but if you do have something on your books currently, then you may want to dictate saying maybe we'll go with a 64, which mm -hmm. I think is a great mm -hmm. size. I mm -hmm. love the 64 gallon size. It, yeah. It's very handy in regards to how maneuver, uh, how easy it is to maneuver um, for all ages from yeah. You know, five-year-olds to a 75-year-old. So I love the 64-gallon personally. Uh, and then you get the lower 32-gallon uh, as well. So there's a, a mix that you can find. But I, I would suggest or hope that you would uh, try to zero in on at least one size and then have an exception. Mm -hmm. So stick with the 64, stick with the 96, and then have a 32 for some type of exception. Okay. So And just to minimize in inventory. All right. So. Okay. What is your normal for for the, the the town to to plan for this, what's the normal depreciation of this? I mean, is it ten years? Is it fifteen years? Is it eight years? Here, when should we be planning to have to replace the process, replace all the barrels? So I, I typically I say ten years. Uh, mm -hmm. A typical lifespan is really fifteen years. Okay. Uh, but if if, if a resident leaves it outside in the sun and the salt and the water, they get mm -hmm. beat up, mm -hmm. you know, it's, yeah. and, it, and it comes yeah. back down to how aggressive is the automated side loader or with a semi-manual, how aggressive are they? Are they throwing it over a snow bank or mm -hmm. they just place it by the <laughs> snow bank? So, I mean, there's real world scenarios and our testing, you know, tries to go above the, it goes above the ANSI specs, but it tries to go the real world specs uh, in the field testing. So, yeah. 10 years is reasonable, yeah. So, and like I said, I have, I, I pulled out a burgundy cart that was just about 28 years old. So, <laughs> you know, you just, you, you don't know what you're going to find. So, uh, again, mine's, my cart's 14 years old right now and it looks brand new, but I wash mine every month. Yeah, yeah. So, it's kind of, I wash my cart. How many people wash their cart? So, but I'm in the business, so I kind of try to do the right thing. Okay. So. So that's uh, just a little about uh, our cart sizes and then also some of our testing standards that we require to do. So next I'll, I'll, talk, I'll, I'll touch upon our staging area. So if you do um, say, Lou, you know what, we love your product, we love your presentation, you know, let's, let's move forward next year, we want your carts. So what I recommend is staging area and uh, we would prefer to have a paved or it really is preferred a paved type of location. So I'm going to interrupt you at this point to ask our town manager, do we have 5,000 to 8,000 square feet um, in the public works garage area that we could stage this? Or is there any place where we could stage you this? Have, you have the old um, highway garage building that has not had a dedicated use yet. Still got that is that is that this uh, approximate square footage? Because oh, I don't know. All right. Yeah. I, okay. Say that that would be All right, so that's our first. <coughs> sure. Okay. Like, well, Merrimack, Mass. We we did uh, carts into Merrimack. They gave us an old shalt, uh, salt shed, so and it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't huge at all. So we'll work around it. it mm -hmm. The really the the big thing is, it, can we bring in a tractor trailer and can they turn around and can they access it? Uh, okay. So during our uh, distribution what we do is the first day we'll bring it depending on the size and the, and the scope with 3300 we'll bring in probably two trailer loads uh, the first day and then the next day we'll bring in one and bring in one load until we max uh, until we hit the number of carts that we're going to be putting out so uh, again it's I'll show you uh, in, a, in a couple slides I'll show you a picture we did in Framingham we essentially had about uh, seven eight thousand carts on the ground uh, so they brought in uh, multiple trailer loads before the project even started so we could stay ahead because we had eight crews on the ground uh, distributing carts. So it kind of, it, it's all within reason in regards to the scope of the job. So you distribute them to the residents? Residents mm -hmm. themselves, correct. Yep, yes. they do, yes. So, this, so the staging area, we, we uh, 
prefer, uh, I don't say it's mandatory because you never know what you're going to come up to, but uh, a, a concrete or, or asphalt, um, even, even with uh, a paved uh, location, the, the, it's static electricity is going to start collecting dust and it gets dirty and it, it's messy. But if you don't have it paved, you, they say, oh, we have crushed gravel. There's never any puddles. Uh, you know, this is what this customer said. And the, the forklift and the tractor trail is getting stuck in it. And it's just the nature of the beast. That's what happens. But, uh, you know, again, it comes back down to trying to be proactive and making sure we have the uh, right space. Jay, did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. So if you're out delivering them, is there an option for you to take away the old one? And do you guys use that? I for... will touch upon oh, that. Okay. Yeah. I have, yes. That's the same the question myself, that I have, sorry. too. Yeah. See, great minds think alike. <laughs> so, and, and again, I was kind of telling you, this was actually a rollout they did in Orange County um, uh, down in Florida. And they, again, they were bringing in uh, a bunch of carts uh, ahead of the program, but there was also 300,000 carts for the project. So okay. it's all, again, within reason. This, this yard is absolutely huge. So, yeah. um, And you'll see the staging area, uh, assembly and distribution, where we're bringing the carts curbside. And then we actually scan our cart. We have an RFID tag inside the cart, and they'll scan it on site. Mm -hmm. And it will record the RFID, yeah. the serial number on the front, yeah. and then the address with the you know, GIS information, latitude, longitude of where it was placed and with mm -hmm. a date stamp saying, all right, Monday at 6.30, it was at 123 Main Street. And then we, we record that. And then the next morning, my project manager would um, send whoever's responsible the email saying the day before all the deliveries with the information on there. And, right. so and that stays the with process. the house location, correct? And that stays, yeah. that we, we keep it in house yep. because even yep. the serial number is basically the, the born on date where the cart was made. And so if there was some type of issue, we can go back and say, all right, what type of material did we use on this run? Or what, what was, is there an issue? Was it us? Or was it, you know, what, what's going on? So we keep the serial numbers uh, in the house at the factories just so we know what press it was, who the operator was. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So we, it will tell us uh, more information on our end, but it'll, it will give you your information that we supply you the, the ex it's essentially, it comes out of the Excel document where we'll have the serial number, RFID, street, date, stamp, and time of the location. So here's one of our crews. So, during, so they'll have a tractor trailer come into the staging area. They'll offload that cart. They'll reconfigure, they'll load up the carts into a box truck, and then they'll hit the road. So we typically would ask for an address list two weeks before the actual start of the distribution. And we'd want that vetted out as best as possible, where you know, uh, if you have notes of any vacant homes, um, new, new um, developments that will require more than one cart per uh, unit or any nuances in regards to the list, we try to get that ahead of time so we won't uh, be stopped during the distribution and trying to figure out what we need to do during that time. And what, so what they do is they assemble them uh, inside the truck. So essentially with uh, the Sterling model, like this 32, they essentially what they're doing is they're taking them off the stack, putting in the axle, snapping in the two wheels, and then they're bringing it curbside and they're scanning the cart to the resident's house. And that's what they're doing. And ideally, they, they'll put them um, in the ideal spot uh, for the pickup time as well, if they're automated. staging area and then our uh, crew was uh, delivering them to the curb. And here's a, a, a picture. Uh, this was in uh, Milton, Mass, where uh, you would see on the left-hand picture, you would see the slide where the carts, they brought them up off the street uh, this time. But you see the, the literature that is um, sticking outside the, the cart. So we actually have a hook uh, in our cart lid that if you wanted to have information for the residents, that you would, it's a door knocker bag. You put any type of uh, resident uh, information that you'd want. If it's their recycling schedule, their do's and don'ts, their, you know, this is the new program, whatever, you know, anything. Could be the upcoming events for a hazardous waste day, 
whatever, you'd be able to get it in here and roll it out to all your residents. And it doesn't necessarily have to relate to trash. It can be really anything that the town needs to convey to the residents. What we would like to have for Christmas. Whatever, yeah, anything, <laughs> anything. And so we're actually the only vendor that actually has a hook on the inside of our lids. I mean, we push it out and then we you know, have it. So then they're coming up upon the, the cart and they'll say, oh, what's this? And then they could read it or not read it. Most of them probably don't read it, but you never know. And then they uh, give the information. So uh, one of the questions that you had was, we have a buyback program for, for carts, but it's really injection molded carts. Uh, so the Rubbermaid 30 gallon bin, um, the, that type of plastic isn't um, favorable for us to reuse and in, in, into our um, recycling um, spec type material. Uh, so we technically do not offer a program to take those type of carts back. If they were an injection molded product, mm -hmm. we would have some type of program in place uh, for that to use. So fast forward 12, 15 years later, you say, you know what, the carts are all lived their life. Let's redo a new program. We'll deliver more carts and do a recovery. That's when we'll take those back. We would pay, depending on what the market is, five cents, 10 cents, 25 cents per pound for the material. And then we'd issue a credit back for the material uh, for that. But for um, the existing carts or the existing barrels that your residents may have, uh, again, dealing with if it's a Casella or Waste Management or Pinard or whoever may be the, uh, the, the, the hauler, uh, typically they would uh, could set up uh, a function. It. Yeah. If it's an open top in DPW where you'd load it, uh, load it up on, a, on you know, the first two sat, um, Saturdays in June or whatever the case may be, we would tend to try to push that out. And that would be on the literature during your uh, distribution of saying, hey, if you need to return your old barrels, this is where you gotta go. Um, another thing is I, what I tend to try to recommend is to have, have the residents turn them into a green waste uh, container. Um, use them for yard waste or whatever the case may be, just to reuse it, you know, just why throw them out if you could try to repurpose it or reuse it, so. Um, so for the, for, uh, Town like Plasto, uh, with 3,300 units, uh, doing both trash and recycling, I would slate this for about six days for the distribution. Um, so, uh, and again, it's a matter of if you're gonna do 96 and 96, 96, 64s, or whatever the case may be. So I'd say about six days to do the distribution. Okay, go ahead, Jay. Does, um, does color play into the life of the, the barrel? It does. So, uh, black typically will heat up the material inside, um, but we have, I've, I've have customers that have lime green to yellow to the standard you know, immiscible blue and and yellow lids. Um, so it, it it comes into play, but in regards to longevity of the cart, it should not have any structurally uh, issues with it because we have UV content in there. Uh, you know, uh, to inhibit uh, any type of uh, degradation okay. to the plastic itself. Now, I did want to touch real quick before my time's up. I hope it's not up yet. Um, the difference between a trash cart and a recycling cart right. was one of the questions. I, again, my, one of my recommendations is uh, because of inventory and manpower and everything else, I would say keep your, your cart body the same color. So if you choose a, a green cart, um, so green cart bottom, green lid, and then if you wanted a recycling cart, you have your green bottom with the yellow lid. Oh. And then, then if you get in a jam, you literally just pop off the lid, put a new lid on, and you're off and running if you ran out, if you're running low on recycling carts, or, or vice versa. So that would be my recommendation in regards to uh, the differentiate between a trash and recycling. It's the same type of cart, same old, so there's not anything new in regards to just calling it a trash or recycling. Two things that we could do. We could have a hot stamp uh, on the lid, on the front portion of the lid, uh, which again, I typically, this is pretty popular, where it just says trash only street side. And then I have one that says recycling only street side. So it's not earth shattering here. And then also, uh, if you look on the 
top of the lid itself. This is called an animal label, and you can be extremely creative on what you want to do in regards to the do's and don'ts, uh, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, or anything like that uh, regarding uh, the current program or the recycling program. Um, but I typically, uh, it looks nice, but I'm starting to um, say with this climate, with recycling, glass goes away, it says glass, now it's kind of a catch-22. So I've been kind of pushing back in regards to sticking a permanent um, label that's saying this is acceptable, this isn't acceptable, because we don't know what China's going to do, and we don't know if we're going to create more uh, recycling facilities in, in, in Maine and New Hampshire and in Mass. So I've been kind of pushing back on that. Uh, but uh, again, you could be vague and say, go to plastow.com uh, and, and point people into your website to say what's... what's or we don't need it at all. Or, or nothing. Right. right. So, so I have just one last question. Okay. I'm not sure about the rest of the board, but I was reading about echo carts and smart carts. What are the differences? Okay, so we have uh, an eco cart, and so uh, it essentially was uh, released in January, and so we're essentially the first uh, cart manufacturer that is taking true curbside plastic uh, out of the waste stream and put it into the cart itself. So right now we have, uh, we make a cart, it's, we call it an eco cart, it's right now it's a black cart, but we have 10% of true curbside recycling okay. content in the cart. Okay. And uh, so there's some contracts that I have um, with, like, say, Massachusetts uh, DEP. We have a 30% recycling material in there, but that's you know, uh, old regrind from old carts and other type of post-industrial recycling content and stuff like that. So we can still have that, and that goes up to 50% for the cart. But the true curbside recycling, which is ex extremely exciting, um, we have 10%. We're soon to, by 2025, we want to have at least 25% of the true curbside recycling content in there. And we want to start offering uh, other colors. So right now we have black. We're looking to try to get green and gray into the, the family. That's going to come sooner than later. But hopefully by 2025, we'll be getting up to about 25% of um, material. So for our smart cart, all our carts are smart now because we do, uh, it's a standard item that we offer is an RFID chip uh, inside the cart itself. So any manufacturer that has a truck system, they would be able to uh, go to the location, pick it up, and be able to read the cart so they know that, um, 123 Main Street, they have their recycling cart out there, they're participating in that program, they're doing a good job, and then they can move on to the next street. It's not going to, unless they have scales, but it's just basically saying it's a notification saying, yep, they're recycling. Yes, they have their trash out. Yes, they have their recycling out. So, so does any the board have any more questions? Go ahead, Jay. I just have one. Um, so say we, we took a 1,000 of these containers, base rate, no decals or anything on it what are we what are we looking at for uh, it really boils down to some of it is, is freight um, so uh, depending on the size so you're looking uh, mid 35 range up to with the 96 you're talking just about under 50 bucks uh, for a 96 uh, but again uh, the more you the more quantity you purchase the unit price goes down and your the unit price comes down because of freight as well or well, you can go to, so, you can go to Home Depot and get a 96 and they're and like they're 100 almost 100 bucks 100 so, bucks so yeah so yeah. again 3300 units uh, with with delivery um, you know so assembly and distribution as well that would be an additional charge so you're you could be looking anywhere from four to five bucks depending on how what the square mileage is and the density of the location, uh, but you're probably looking at um, all in probably mid 50s with with the delivery. And don't hold, please hold, don't. No, hold we would we would send out a formal to, RFP yeah. and ask you for formal numbers. Just, so we're just looking at ballpark yeah, numbers. So it's ballpark, not it's yeah. not completely out of the water. So I yeah. mean, again, at Home Depot, your retail, it's a lot of markups and stuff like that. But with with this cart, you could certainly um, get away with it fairly cheap. Now, saying that, because you don't have a cart right now, currently in your, your system, you may want to explore the recycling partnership. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody's heard of that or not, but we work with those uh, guys quite uh, quite well, 
and uh, it's a great avenue to uh, touch base. I did bring uh, one of the um, their their grant uh, information, their application form, uh, and you could review it, and I can get you in touch with the right people. And it's just a matter of if you have a recycling coordinator in town, uh, you can fill out the application. Uh, you can help qualify for the program, and essentially what you do is they could give you up to $15 uh, grant money back uh, for a purchase of a recycling cart. Great. So it's essentially Great. it's free money out there that you could do. You would, your uh, responsibility would be some documentation and recording mm -hmm. of some data, right. uh, but it's, it's That's really a good. great yeah. avenue for you to jumpstart the program and get a big benefit. And they, have, they used to have, you could get 15 bucks for the cart and $1 for education, and it changes every year typically, but I think right now it could be anywhere from seven to 15, depending on the size and the scope of the, the, the job. So okay, great. It, it, is, it is an avenue. Okay, one last question, one go ahead, question. Um, On like a, I don't know, 64, how many bags of trash? Five, four or five? Yeah, you're, t you're talking, I mean, again, if you equate it 15 gallon trash bags for your kitchen, so you look at four to five, not everybody fills it completely. Some people don't necessarily take the ear out of their trash bag, but typically four to six uh, bags on the 64, okay. uh, six to nine uh, on the 96. So it's, you know, it, okay. uh, that, that's pretty good, good guide. So where, where uh, recycling is not worthwhile because of the tip rate, the, the transport cost, um, would a much larger, a single larger cart be recommended or that's a great question and i know you have collection uh mm -hmm. presentations next yep. but and they certainly would uh, answer that but uh, what i see uh that you'd want to probably do is offer a 96 gallon cart right. and have it go every other week oh. because you're not going to have a, an odor issue or anything like that so you could again curb your cost in regards to going an every other week route and get a larger cart and go, you know, with that exactly. type of service, and exactly. it would be a win-win for for everybody. You're with your yep. budget, yep. and yep. then the exactly. resident has a cart, and they don't have to fumble around. And um, so that is an an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much Thank for you. coming. I appreciate we really it. appreciate Thank all you. the information you gave us. And I, can I take that? Um, yes. Yeah. All right. Just in case we need to have that. All right, and um, I will be <coughs> in touch with you. Okay. Great. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. I need a bigger one. Just give it a shake test. Pardon? Oh, you want a bigger, a bigger one? one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. You. Okay. Um, so I believe our next presenter is from Caseller. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. All right. And I don't know who you are, so if you'd be so kind to introduce yourself to all of us, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. And um, Lou, if you want, you can use the elevator to take that stuff downstairs. Okay. All right. No, that's fine. That's fine. Yep. Jump in. And um, did you have a presentation? Yeah, you do. You do. Okay. Plug right there. See it? Yep. Hanging out of the side of that. Hopefully, it's going to have Got it? Yeah. All right. the same Is it VGA? Or is it yeah, HDMI? I have a VGA cable with me. I don't know if that's. I did bring it right. over. We're supposed to have an adapter. Do you want me to get Dean? Yeah, is that one right? The third yeah. input. And I don't even. Uh, this phone isn't even working. Do you, do you have your cell phone with you, or? I do I don't have his number? What's another thing? It, I, this this is, doesn't have a dial tone. It's six six one, but there's no dial tone on the phone. Let's see if we can get our gurus to do that. Uh, I, have a, I don't have that. I did, yeah, I did bring a uh, set of books on it. Is it HDMI? Yeah, it's HDMI. Do you have an HDMI port on your laptop? Uh, That's kind of odd. No, uh, it's got the VG, VGA. Wow. Yeah, I'm surprised. Right. 
Yeah, I could put it on somebody if someone had a USB. I might actually. I don't think you can I'm plug a right USB right in. What's that? I don't think you can plug a USB, USB in. I just send a USB. No. no. I can throw it. I can throw it on to. Uh, on the laptop, that's okay. Right, yeah, you don't have any um, paper copies of your presentation with you? I have some other handouts, but not the presentation, some additional handouts that I have. I was going to add to All right, well, maybe you could hand those out while we're waiting for yeah, you to absolutely. get that done. Oh, is this in the Great, thank know. you. This is just please for you. It's fine, please for you. Okay, yeah, so we should be fine. Yeah. While we're getting started, yeah. my yeah. name is David Allen. David, hi. Uh, this is Brian Groshon. I'm the general manager of the Thank you. Manager operation. Brian is the assistant general manager. Thank you. So they're saying that Brian is the third time I've had Thank the you. opportunity. To <laughs> so we're excited to to be back here. All right. So what I handed out is, um, and we, we can start just talking about this piece. Is you know we find that a lot of communities there's a lot of misnomers out there regarding what's happening to recycling. Um, so, Casella operates one of the largest material recovery facilities east of the Mississippi, out of Boston, Massachusetts. We have several other material recovery facilities in our geographic footprint that we, that we own and manage. Um, the material that would be particularly produced here in, in Plastow would, would end up at that facility. Um, a material recovery facility is basically because it's all single stream, some people we trademark it as zero sort. Mm -hmm. you know, all, all your recyclables go into one bin. They take it to that material recovery facility, separate the material, and then sell that on the commodities market. Because of what happened with China back in 2017 now, um, obviously the recycling market took a huge decline. Mm -hmm. um, however, Casella has maintained its recycling program. We have very viable markets that we market the material to. So the, the front page there it talks about some of the truths and myths of what happens to your recycling. The second page talks about some of the markets that we sell to. Um, so feel free to read that. Um. So what Brian was describing in 2017, I'm sure you're going to talk a little bit about what happened. In, with the Chinese market, primarily fiber. Mm -hmm. um, 30 some odd percent of the world's recycling went to that one market. Uh, and they went and did what we've been begging them to do since the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. <laughs> they started cleaning up their air. And one of the ways they did that was shutting down a whole bunch of paper mills that in the late 70s we moved off overseas. Uh, as they had that along with all the geopolitics that, that we're not going to influence had a devastating impact on that market. Uh, one of the largest buyers of that fiber company used to be called Seven Dragons, and now they're called Nine Dragons because they own and operate nine very large paper mills. He is one of our primary buyers. We are one of their primary suppliers. They've recently, you may have read, purchased a couple of the mothballed pulp mills in Maine to retool them as new pulp mills. <clears throat> We're not privy to their exact business plan, but we do know that a buying market closer to us geographically He's will be seen. good for the market. Yeah. But that is a long-term view, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We're trying to replace a market dynamic that had empty container ships, literally a slow boat to China. <laughs> going back to China that we were able to build very inexpensively because they were going back yeah, anyway. Sorry. So that those were the economics that worked. Thank you. Um, now there's not a market for those materials in, uh, in, in that part of uh, the world. So those ships are going back empty. Um, the thing to remember uh, and that we encourage all communities that are recycling to remember, recyclers are not in the recycling business. They're in the paper making business. So they happen to make paper out of a, com a recycled commodity. But their goal is to make a high quality product, paper, as inexpensively as they can. And recycling has proven for decades that we can be the feedstock supply to that industry. That's one of the reasons why, as Brian said, we've continued to invest in our recycling infrastructure because we believe. The future is, is bright, uh, but it demands a stronger, more stable, more longer viewed infrastructure to supply. 
uh, just like the paper business was in New England 25 years ago, um, that infrastructure is really difficult and expensive to replace. So that's part of the reason why, we, part of the reason, the primary reason we've made that investment. Um, yeah, I think it's important when we're talking about recycling to make sure people understand that's our perspective. Mm -hmm. David, quick question. Yes, With this market, because you've seen it uh, decline, and you've seen it when it was good, with respect to the contracts that you're writing now, are you writing any contracts that would adjust the price as the market changes for recycling so that someone doesn't lock, lock themselves into a long term at a low recycling you know, cost, and then you know, they, can, they can move it, move the contract with the market? That's, that's a great question. And virtually any contractor agreement with any supplier, a municipality of, of recycled commodities, and a processor is going to be market sensitive. Some kind of formula that shares, you know, the upside when it comes up. It shares the downside as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so the short answer is absolutely. Any agreement that uh, we've done in the last two and a half years, right, three, three, has four. has had some kind of formula uh, so that the the uh, the ebb and flow of the market is reflected in what the, the, the customer is paying or not paying. Yeah. And then, and that's something new that wasn't in previous contracts. Relatively new to the industry, yeah. There was, a, you know, we're, uh, and I'm jumping ahead of Brian's uh, uh, presentation, but we're as much in the risk management business as, right. as any business that manages a commodity, right? Whether it's uh, pork bellies or soybeans, right? We've been managing a, a recycled uh, feedstock commodity, um, and, and imagine if you were locked into a price per barrel for oil for 10 years, and given what's happened over the last two. Mm -hmm. um, so, so learning from other commodities, we've gone to a formula. Um, we, we have some, we call them legacy contracts, that we're, we're taking one on the chin, but we, 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 we honor our deals. Uh, so we have a few legacy contracts that are still flat rated out there. Uh, but I, I'm fairly confident that, that the new normal will always have some kind of formula. Is your headquarters in this area in Salem on, uh, on Pelham Road? It is, it is. We have, in New Hampshire, we have offices in Salem, uh, Belmont, uh, Portsmouth, uh, facilities in Raymond, Allenstown. Concord. Concord. And then uh, we're also up in the northwest, uh, Newport uh, area. Yeah. Then up in Bethlehem, and then, of course, our home office is, is in Rutland. So David, you said that most of the R recycling is um, for the paper, for the pulp, recovering. The large majority, the large majority of material picked up what curbside happens, is, what is happens, fiber. What happens to the plastics, which is probably the, other, the largest, um, largest The largest by volume, the smallest by weight right. mm -hmm. and by That's value. Right. Yeah. All of our plastic is marketed domestically. Okay. Um, you, you know, I think Brian's handout of the truth about recycling, yeah. um, you hear a lot of stories. Um, our story is pretty transparent, pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, the only way we've survived these market conditions, uh, and it, you can imagine what it's been like to survive that kind of market fluctuation, is by being completely transparent with where our material goes. Okay. We've also developed a reputation producing a very, you hear a lot of um, untruths about the contamination rate of single stream recycling. Um, the same people are, those are the same buyers buying it, whether it came through a zero sort or a source separation. And they're paying the same price. In these horrible market conditions, quality wins the day, right? In, in any commodity, when the mark, when buyers aren't out there, you gotta provide a high quality product. We've been able to maintain those markets because of that high quality. So in particular, plastics, uh, we, it's been painful. Uh, mm -hmm. Materials that we used to get paid for, sometimes we have to pay to move. But they are marketed domestically. And how about glass and, and metals? The same. Uh, metals have been pretty easy. Um, and uh, 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 glass has is, is probably been the biggest challenge. Yeah. Um, it's not. It's not. It's not uh, being. It's not marketable, or is it? Yeah, the last glass remanufacturing. Yeah. yeah so the last um, 
So w when the glass goes through our process, it's crushed into okay. a very mm -hmm. fine material. It's not like you go to the redemption center and you turn a bottle in and they get a bottle, right? They, right. they take the crushed glass and then remanufacture it into products. The only facility in the Northeast that did that shut down. And because of the weight of the material, obviously it gets expensive to move. So we are, as Casella, we've started to use it in other applications, construction applications in particular. Um, we are now utilizing the glass in that format. So it's not, uh, it's being reused and kind of recycled. For, all, for other purposes. Other for other purposes. Purpose. Yeah. 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 So one of, those, was one of those purposes, uh, materials for making roadways? Yeah. Yes. It, it, yeah. It, is. Yeah. it is. It is. Absolutely. Yep. I'm, I'm not, so I, I took his spot here. So I'm going to let him he's, uh, start through his proposal and presentation, and maybe we'll get some more questions. Okay. 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 Yep. Great. Yeah. To reiterate to Dave's point, we, we appreciate the opportunity to come here and speak with you all. Um, you know, the, I think the context of this conversation is to let you know a little bit about us and, and who Casella is. So Dave and I introduced mm -hmm. ourselves. So. Casella was founded um, in 1975 by a couple brothers that wanted to start a recycling company. And they worked hard and they achieved to who we are today. From a hauling standpoint, our company is really regionally located in the Northeast. Um, primarily in uh, Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Vermont, mm -hmm. New York is where our primary locations are. We do have other parts of our business that are actually spread throughout the entire country. Um, but from a hauling standpoint, we are very regionally specific. We are a publicly traded company, um, and we are also vertically integrated from hauling, transfer stations to landfills, um, as well as we talked about the material recovery facilities for uh, recycling material. So Dave and I have introduced ourselves, um, kind of what our roles are. At the end of the day, for Dave and myself, we provide the lanes and freedom maneuver to our uh, operations manager for him to do his job um, and to provide the best service possible to the town that we have a contract with. Um, the operations manager is John Augusta. He has been in this business for a very, very long time. Probably longer than I've been alive, I, I joke about, but. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we are very lucky to have him uh, as a part of our team. John actually used to own his own uh, waste company uh, in southern New Hampshire um, and has since uh, come to work for us. Um, we also do have an operations supervisor that is more of the boots on the ground uh, here in town, especially on collection day to ensure that we're, we're servicing the residents properly as well as deal with any um, you know, service uh, issues, if there's any safety questions, or and also do root audits to make sure our guys are doing all the right things. So if I could jump in, so the way we're organized in southern central New Hampshire, there's a John Augusta, and then for each municipal uh, service we provide, whether it's Aftonson or uh, Kingston or um, Danville, there's that root supervisor. That's the guy you see out on the street every day. Uh, reporting back to John. John is the quarterback, right? And when things go wrong, John adjusts, and and you never hear about it, right? Because we're we're hopefully ahead of that game. <laughs> that dynamic applies to every aspect of our company. As you go further north, uh, out of the Belmont operation, there's a similar model servicing Concord and Laconia, and a similarly skilled team focused on those services. So. Okay. You know, part of our hallmark is not to be so, we try not to be a mile wide and an inch deep. We try to be staffed appropriately uh, as locally as we can be. So one of the things we like to talk about is safety to ensure that our customers feel comfortable with how we train our employees. Um, so with new hires, um, there's a six week onboarding period that they'll go through, um, kind of the crawl, walk, run mentality um, before they're out there on their own. If they come to us with some waste experience previously or some experience in the industry, sometimes that uh, timeline will be shortened a bit uh, mm -hmm. based off uh, manager evaluations. Uh, we do do weekly safety meetings, so manager-led safety meetings every Wednesday morning at 4 a.m. I am at the division. Uh, conducting a safety meeting to ensure that I touch each employee because uh, we uh, guys start at a different start times throughout the morning but um, we lead that every every week um, to touch our employees at least once a week from a manager standpoint the supervisor um, like we talked about earlier will touch the employees out on route 
and kind of, we call them tailgate talks, um, you know, <laughs> and address certain safety issues that might be happening in the industry or the company uh, to keep them up to date on what's going on. Um, we also do some uh, truck inspections. You know, we audit our fleet all the time to make sure that we're putting quality equipment out there and that our employees are taking care of the trucks. We also are supported being a, the company and the size that we are. We do have a regional safety team that we can lean on to help support us in our initiatives locally at the division. Um, you know, their, their uh, visibility is more on the regional standpoint, but they do provide a lot of capability and resources to us. All our trucks go through a preventive, preventative maintenance plan. Um, every 150 hours, they'll go through a different scheduled maintenance, as well as obviously all unscheduled maintenance that occurs is addressed immediately. So talking about safety and maintenance is not the sexiest part of the business. Yeah. But you always hear people talk about safety important. first, and then it's the last thing they talk about. We try very hard not to, to walk that way. Okay. Uh, it is very important to us. It's, a, it's an integral part of the way we're organized. Um, Brian and I just left uh, sharing an office with the regional safety manager, and he commented that Brian and I and, and one other gentleman are the most frequent um, uh, email addresses on his email and that's not because we're misbehaving <laughs> it's because we, we we take that safety first um, slogan and we try to live it uh, again we bring it up at a meeting like this to try and show you we're trying to walk the walk so who do we support so with Casella being as big of a company as we are, we do provide municipal collection throughout the Northeast, whether it be Maine, Massachusetts, and here in New Hampshire. For the Salem division specifically, these are some of the contracts that we have, 50% uh, of which are automated collection. Mm -hmm. uh, the other half are, are, are through manual collection, which I believe is what um, Plastow is today. Just to highlight, you know, obviously your neighbor Atkinson, we did transition them from manual to automated collection back in 2018. Um, Alan Fair was the town administrator yes. at the time, yeah. now David Cressman. For, for us, we'll let them tell us, tell you how we're doing, uh, but I would strongly encourage you to reach out to them. Uh, Merrimack Master at the bottom, uh, we also provide automated collection there, only for the recycling. They're, they're trash, they have a pay-as-you-throw trash system, so they've decided to keep, keep that through manual collection. Um, but we did transition their recycling to automated, and they are mm -hmm. on an every other week uh, schedule for recycling. We do half the town one week, the other half the second week. Um, both Danville and Allenstown, we've had those relationships for a long time now, both automated. I think Danville was back in 2012, and Allenstown was right about the same time period that we transitioned them from uh, a manual to an automated collection. So, Brian, if we go to an automated service, um, would you service our account using other vendors' carts? Or is that a caveat that... Uh, no. So, so we, there, there are, the answer is we'll provide uh, service to whatever cart the town or the city decides to use. There okay. are a lot of ways, okay. a lot of different recipes to mm -hmm. make that soup. Mm -hmm. Some towns want to own the carts. Some towns want us to own the carts. Right. Some towns want a lease. So there, there are all sorts of ways to do that. The okay. financing of it. There are a couple of different, a couple of vendors, two or three. Uh, we have a great relationship uh, with the gentleman you just uh, heard mm -hmm. from. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, so the short answer is absolutely. Okay, as great. As long as it's an appropriate cart. So, right, yeah. right, okay, yeah. good. And typically also to add to Dave's comment is we will only pick up the authorized cart for that town. So okay. there's obviously, you can go to Home Depot and pick up yep. a yeah. toter you can find at Home Depot, which is the same cart that you can also have a municipal collection with, with automated collection. When we do the automated collection, we will only collect the um, town's approved cart. We will not pick up if a household decides to put other homemade cards out there. Okay. So, so can you give us a ballpark time frame of what it, how long it would take for you to integrate your services into our town as far as replacing an older vendor? I don't know if you can do that, but how long would that take? So if we were to walk out of the room tonight with a, uh, an agreement you just threw at us for all the money we could possibly ask for. Of um, course, <laughs> of course. Right. Um, <laughs> So there are, there are a couple, uh, it's primarily equipment uh, pressure points. Mm -hmm. First one being cart, he just spoke to Lou and I, 
I don't know what did he tell you probably 12 weeks ish there's about 12 weeks lead time is that well I I'm going to be very blunt and honest with you that our contract expires um, June 30th of 2021 so we have a whole year to play with this but I just need to have some kind of a of an idea of what you are all looking for because I like to be proactive and make sure we everybody has plenty of time to absorb this and now I understand learn. Your question. Yeah. we were complimenting you on being so proactive because lead times for trucks right now is as much as a year. Okay, so, so good. all uh, right. Having said that, all right. we maintain a fleet that has some flexibility so that we can grow. Um, we, we would ideally ask for three months. Okay. Uh, in a perfect world, uh, the, the, the more lead time you have, mm -hmm. the less a vendor like us is gonna have to maybe rent a truck. Okay. However it happens, that rental cost gets passed on to you, so Obviously, the less right. you have us rent a truck the more money you save, okay. you'll save. So it, it is actually my hope that the board will be able to arrive at some kind of a decision by the end of September at the latest, because we're in the middle of budget, they will be in the middle of budget season at that point. So we'll obviously need to, to plan for that. So that should give you guys plenty of time yeah, if we choose you as a vendor. Okay, for, okay. For all, yeah. all right, great. Okay, all right, go ahead, Julian. I'm gonna ask the stupid question. No, you never <laughs> ask stupid questions. The uh, looking at it bottom line, What's the benefit, costs, otherwise, or, or even non-benefits of going manual versus automated? Why does someone go automated, not manual? Is, is there a cost difference? Is it some other reason? Why does someone reason? go from automated to manual? Or Either manual way. Yeah. Well, why so would they, mostly why would labor. They, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. the question. Why yeah, would so, they, why wouldn't So to talk about, so we'll, we won't lie. We love automated collection, yeah. especially when you talk about the labor market. I was just going to, yeah, the la labor is really, I think, the bottom line, and I think that's what our last vendor really discussed was that, you know, there's there's no workman's comp, there's no, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff involved with labor training and everything else that, that obviously that cost gets passed on to, um, you know, the Absolutely. municipality. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. You know, labor piece is probably the yeah. biggest component yeah. of it all. Yeah. There's efficiencies. Um, the type of truck that we operate takes about six seconds to empty a barrel, comparative to a, someone getting off the back of the yeah, truck, yeah. putting the bags in, you're talking, depending on how much is put out, 20, 30 <laughs> seconds to stop. Yeah. Um, then you also, so the, the cost of labor, the efficiency, typically we'll recommend to municipalities for the recycling, I heard Lou talk about it a little bit ago, is doing an every other week schedule for the recycling. Mm -hmm. yep. um, that's where you can experience some savings as well. Um, the 96 gallon cart, if people recycle properly, if they break down their cardboard, the 96 gallon provides ample space for them to recycle on an every other week basis. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Those are probably the three biggest components to it all, not to mention the aesthetics of a community for on collection yeah, day yeah. and post collection day. No. Because of what's happening in the recycling market, plastic bags in the recycling market are, are, mm -hmm. are frowned upon. Yep. And if not, some depending on how some contracts are written, you can actually get charged for that contamination being in the, in the material or it just doesn't get picked up. Mm -hmm. um, and so loose recycling in a bin on a windy day, nobody's a fan of. Uh, I'm sure the DPW is not a fan of it, right? Because it just, <laughs> it, it creates litter at the um, with the automated collection, it's contained, uh, you know, loose carts, there's a quality cart, um, and they stay closed on wind, windy days, they stay upright, um, and the truck is able to collect them with, you know, minimal mess, uh, if, it, if any at all. So. I, I will add that as, you know, the labor point can't be underemphasized. Mm -hmm. The yeah. average, you know, the 25-year-old kid coming off the farm to be a truck driver, He's, he's not there anymore. Applicants yeah. coming in the door look more like me than they do like Brian. And if you want me to work 40 <laughs> or 50 hours a week picking up trash, I can do that with a joystick. But if you're gonna hang me on the back of the truck, you're gonna need more than one of us. Mm -hmm. <coughs> that, that is one of the driving uh, forces mm -hmm. behind automation. Mm -hmm. But it's also longevity, right? Even if I am 25 years old, that truck is predictable, it speaks to Brian's efficiencies. It's gonna behave the same way every time. And so when problems arise, they're more solvable. You can see them coming sooner and solve for them before they mm -hmm. even happen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but it, it can't be underemphasized um, that the reality of the labor market, uh, mm -hmm. we yeah. as employers 
uh, in a, uh, a highly uh, labor-intensive industry. We have to change if we want to survive this. Yeah. Did you have another question? Go ahead. Yeah, it's, I think it's been a problem we've discussed here before at, at other meetings. Yeah. Um, it's all fine and dandy to have these carts at residence, private residences. Then we get the condoms in the apartments. How do you solve that issue at that level? Yeah, so we've been working with a, a couple other communities here in southern New Hampshire against that very issue. And, I, and I, I think you have to take it location by location, depending on what their needs are. You know, whether you solve it through larger dumpsters that are good service by, a, uh, we call them front load okay. trucks, mm -hmm. that they yeah. would have centralized yeah. um, containers that they would put all their material into and they would get their material, you know, the, the trash and recycling would get collected that way. Um, so there's there's a myriad of approaches to go towards mm -hmm. um, whether you, you know, uh, we have some communities that have actually um, discontinued the collection in their homeowners association or condo community and have subsidized their program saying, hey, you have 100 households, we're going to give you a certain dollar amount every month. It's up to you to go out and find your own private contractor to service your, your, your condo. Yeah, I've also, sorry to interrupt, but sorry. we've also noticed that a lot of times the, they don't recycle. They just put everything in the big trash barrel, the big trash bin, and there is no recycling. You can look at a place that's got a dumpster. There's no recycle bins next to the dumpster. So everything's going in the main trash, and our understanding is if you don't recycle some of it, it actually you'd have, ends up in a landfill. And then it costs more money because it costs money to put it in the landfill, right? So, so it would, how do you solve that problem? It would be our to our advantage to pro perhaps make sure our RFP is very specific with combinations and permutations of give us prices for this, 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 so that we can work with a vendor to, to eliminate the very problem that uh, Jim Absolutely. was talking about. The more information right. you give us, yep. okay. we're, we're pretty good at this. We've been doing this quite a while. <laughs> So the more information you give us about what we might see in town as far as a, a multifamily property, uh, the better recommendation we're going to, to make for you. Okay. Um, yeah. You're absolutely right. The, the, in my house, and, and I would bet the Brian's house too, as you can imagine, we're pretty avid recyclers. But even in my house, recycling stops when the bin is full. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it, we, it, we see it at the curb all the time. And, and when people had a 17-gallon bin, they filled it up. And then they got a 65-gallon cart, and they filled it up. And now they have a 96-gallon cart, and they're filling it up. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, because it's habit in my house. You lose some of that dynamic when I asked my son to, hey, take the trash and the rubbish out to the dumpster on your way to the school bus. Mm -hmm. We see it end up in the dumpster a lot. That is a... The education, the answer is an education campaign, mm -hmm. but it, the education campaign targeted to the single family homeowner is not gonna work the with same, the multi-family right, dwelling, right. and vice versa. So again, the more information you give yeah. your, your vendor, the more tailored the education program, the, the less of, the more of that we're gonna come back. Yeah, I think that's where I was getting to. If we could get some really good help with people who have experience in other places and how to solve these issues, and we could also figure out how you go about implementing it. And, and that's going to be yeah. obviously a discussion we're going to have later on tonight on an RFP. So yeah. did you have one more question or a, a no, question? I, I think you kind of answered the question. All right. I'm, so, I'm sorry to keep interrupting you. No. Go ahead, John. Uh, we talked earlier about the automated, but um, what's the percentage of savings going to automation? It's different it's, in every community. I, I, I wish I could give you that straight answer. Um, uh, it, it, it's really going to be different in every community, and so much of it depends on time, right? The carts will drive. But usually, you're going to capture savings in the efficiency of the truck. Uh, a lot of the cost dynamic is in the carts and whether you buy them and how long, you know, the last 20 years, I've got a couple of 25-year or, or older ones that work every day. How long you want to spread the cost of that out? So it, it is not, I, I can't give you a straight answer. Typically, um, if you depreciate those, those carts over the, their life, um, there are significant savings. But any more specific than that, I, I, I'd be disingenuous. I, I can't tell you that without looking. So if we, if we decided to go with your company and went automated, you couldn't tell us 
what the difference would oh, be. Oh, in advance? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 Oh, certainly. Oh, of okay. course. Yes, that, we would be able to do that, but honestly, sitting here tonight. We, oh, okay. We, yeah, we've yeah. done that previously. Hey, this is what it would look yeah. like if we went manual. Yeah. This would be the proposal if we went And that, again, that's going to be our discussion later on with, with what we're going to put in our RFP, and that's on the agenda for later on tonight. So before, you know, we'll let these gentlemen finish off, and then we can discuss all those little details before we send out the RFP. So just to provide some context to some of the different trucks we operate, this, this truck here listed, it's, a, it's actually, a, we call it a front load truck, but it's, it's a residential front load truck equipped with a Corrado container. That wig container on front is, has an automated arm, which you can see the uh, yellow yeah. fingers coming out from it. Yeah. Um, it then dumps it into the, through the top of the truck, and that's how it, it gets rid of the load. We operate several of these trucks out of Salem. We really like it a lot because of the fact that the driver is oriented forward for the entirety of his route. Um, this truck here, which is a, called an automated side loader, um, the driver does have to tend to look in the rear view mirror to be able to see and align the, the automated arm to the bin. So sometimes his eyesight is not in front of him. So we do, we do prefer the uh, Corrado container in Salem, but we utilize the other type of truck. Um, very frequently, especially in more urban environments, just because of the size. We, we talk about service quality depending a lot on redundancy, you know, having a truck for when the truck does break down. One of the key features of this style truck, this is the same style truck you'd see picking the dumpster up at the movie theater, right? It stabs it and dumps it overhead. So with all trucks, not if, but when that truck breaks down, we have a very versatile fleet of trucks like that, but also commercial trucks that can interchange and back one another up. Okay. The more uniformity we have in our fleet, the more consistent our service, the less you ever find out that we had a truck breakdown on Tuesday, You'll, you won't know about it. It's been, a, again, a, a key feature of the service quality we've been able to provide in some of the towns where I was, was listening. Okay. So does anybody have any last questions before we wrap up this presentation, gentlemen? No, Je go ahead, yeah. Where do you uh, haul the trash to? So it really depends on the contract. So we have contracts that we have to haul material to Turnkey Landfill in Rochester. Uh, we have others that we haul to Wheel of Bird or North Andover. Um, and then we also have our own disposal agreements with Covanta and Haverhill. Okay. Uh, so we, if I may, we also have our own transfer stations yep. that provide, as we have a transfer, the closest one to this area would be Allenstown. But the, the, the strategic value of that transfer station is if anything else is interrupted, we always have that as a, as a backup. Back okay. So by location here, so you pick up, it fell off a truck of trash. Mm -hmm. Does that truck go and then unload the same day that trash at a, at a site at a transfer station? It, yeah, the, so would it go home and then dump the next day? Is that your question? Or? Right. So it, how do we know that the trash you pick up today is yep. yours? Is mine. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So we always, obviously, our trucks are always open to being audited by the community that we service. Um, we do give a detailed report of all our truck weights and the route that it was assigned to. Um, sometimes it may not, because the disposal facility may be closed, depending on what time we finish the route. Was the it trash going to stay in that truck until? Yes. Yeah. 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 And not used until you can find a place. To it's end. not uncommon, especially yeah. given where we are in relation to, let's say it was Covent or Covanto or Wheelabrator, where we don't want to go, we don't want to be on 93 at 4.30 and 5 o'clock in the afternoon. So we'll send that driver home, park the truck, and then go dump the next morning. Yeah. That, that is not uncommon. I understand the concern. Mm -hmm. we, yeah. we as an industry get the concern. Uh, the other side of that is you don't want to pay us to sit in the highway for four hours. You know, that risk gets built into yeah. the price you pay. So it is not uncommon for that trash to go home with us that night and then get dumped early the next morning before we either come back on your route or go on to the next route. Yeah, so, yeah. Are you using the same truck for the recycle and the non-recycle, or are they going to be two separate trucks? Two separate trucks. Okay. Yeah. Right. All right. It's a staggered pickup. One week you're doing um, recycles, one week you're doing trash? No, it really depends on what the community wants. So I talked a little bit earlier about Merrimack, Mass. Um, that community wanted half the town picked up one week. 
and then half the town the other for the recycling. So it kind of flip flop week every the other trash week. Trash every week. Most. But the trash was done weekly. So uh, most most communities trash is done weekly. Yeah. Uh, actually, all of our, the municipalities we service trash is done weekly. Some communities opt for weekly recycling. Others have opted for every other week recycling. So. All righty, all right. Um, if you have no further, uh, Jay, did you Just have one more question? One other ahead? question: um, Do your trucks have a like a, a safety guard for like spillage onto the road? For the the, like, the trash? Yes, for trash. Trash juice? Yeah. Um, yeah. So <laughs> that's a technical term. term. We yeah. call it trash juice. Trash yeah. juice. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, so um, our trucks are, well, one, we, the, especially for the automated, they're all 2015 and newer trucks models. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they are, like I talked about, maintained to ensure that there's no ho holes in the floor, as well as there's a, um, a um, uh, uh, the, the plastic, just kind of a, where the gate opens, it's uh, a. Yeah, it's like a flap. Yeah. yeah, to yeah, kind gasket. of seal it, gasket, yeah, thank you, yeah. holy cow, uh, gasket to seal in that material. Um, and that's changed out pretty regularly because as the tailgate closes and opens, it degrades over time. Um, and then the trucks are, you know, every truck's is, uh, equipped with a spill kit if they were to have a hydraulic or engine We, we get why you asked yeah. the question, yeah. right? Yeah. It does happen, even in the newest truck. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, we've actually had some citizens' complaints very recently about spillage on their streets. And yeah. What style truck are you, do you know if you're collected with a rear loader manually now? Rear right? yes. Manual. yes. So a, a rear loader is, so we run a, a great many rear loaders, right? And when the trash is left at the curb in a bag and it rains, you can imagine, and then yep. it's compacted, right? You're taking mm -hmm. a sponge and squeezing it. <laughs> that rear loader, what we call the hopper, the mm -hmm. bag of it, tends to fill up with liquid. So if that driver turns a corner, it'll yep. splash over. That, it, it, with that style of truck, it's not uncommon. You don't have that dynamic with this style of truck. Okay. But hoses do break. Um, Oh. And it, you know, the the vendor you want is the vendor, hopefully, that comes in and, and talks about safety early on in their presentation because they really mm -hmm. uh, take it seriously. But um, it, we we have a very robust uh, environmental response process uh, because hoses break and hydraulic fluid spills, and uh, we want to get to it and do get to it before it gets in the waterway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, this is the last question, and we're going to wrap it up, is okay? Because we're way past our time. Respond. I'm sorry. Let's say you're winter time most of the time, and you have ice and chunks of ice and snow all over the place, and obviously somebody's wouldn't be level to the road when they're sitting on top of other things from the plows. How good are these are responding to um, picking things that are out of level, or you know, a lot of wind and stuff, and things get knocked over? How does that work in rea in the real life? Yeah. So obviously, a snowstorm presents. A number of challenges. Um, the arm is can be manipulated to pick up the container in a bunch of different positions and set it back down. These trucks are driven from the right side. We, we uh, most of the time drive a what's called a stand up right side truck where the door is actually open for the entirety that that driver can apply the brake, get out, pick up the cart, and then service it. Oh. Um, but um, for the most part, yes, snow days are, are challenging days for us, no doubt. You know, when dealing with the plow and the snow banks and the wind rows of what, what's going on on the roadway. But um, at the end of the day, the, the arm will still pick up the barrel, even if it's leaning a little bit or on its side. If it is fully flopped over, the driver will get up, pick so it up. So you will go out and take care of that. Yeah. Right. We're also a company that cut our teeth in Vermont. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> Say no more. Uh, it, 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 we have to know how to deal yeah. with snow, and we run automated uh, vehicles on similar routes in northern yeah. Vermont as well. Yeah. Brian's right, it's a challenge, uh, but uh, it's it, in us, as for us, it's kind of in our yeah. DNA. Right. Uh, the winter doesn't scare us so much. All right. How do you handle um, special pickups, like monitors or? I think that's a subject for RFPs, okay? So that's what we have to discuss before we can even do that with them. All right, so we're going to table that until we get to the RFP part, okay? Okay. <laughs> what about Paul? All right, so any last-minute uh, words of advice for us before I turn you loose? Yeah, no, we appreciate the opportunity to speak with us. Um, if you do have any more questions that are derived out, you know, feel free. I believe we'll Aaron Banfield is one. Right. Um, I forgot my business card on me, but um, 
we'll get your information and right. um, if you have any questions feel free to reach out all right Pretty thank you so much talk trash all you want yes. yeah. all right thank you so much we really appreciate you taking the time to speak Thanks with us. us all right, all right. You. you have a good night gentlemen thank you, you too. Before right, I use so it. do we want to bring oh, oh. oh my god it's white too. So if you crush the can first you can get it in there. I think I am very short like yes. Yes, thank you. you All right, it, so you can get it in there first. Um so do you want me to go back downstairs? No, I'll get I'll get you all set? Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> they they know each other. I get the whole question. Put the can in it, it just makes a little flat disc. I know. Yeah. I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I, I do want to let you know there's a bunch of different things that we need to discuss through the RFP that Jay and I worked on. So um, that's part of the RS, RFP um, delineation does fit. as to whether we do the semi annually white goods. It's all part of <coughs> that piece of the RFP. I was curious because they're a vendor. Uh, how do they handle, how they, they handle they, that issue? They, they can were do. To say to us, they can do whatever we, we ask. We no, they do. Them. They do. And the reason I know that is because I I did some great research with these guys through other mm. um, towns. Oh, okay. You're still so on. That, yeah, just wait till we get there. You're still <laughs> on. We're not there. There. That's all right. We can still talk. Okay. It's not. It's not like it's not public knowledge. So. Um, <laughs> so that's that's going to be. Um, an interesting RFP and it might take one or two revolutions to flesh it out. And I also asked Sumner if he would look it over as well because I guess he has a lot of experience in doing RFPs yep. for trash contracts. Right. So he will make sure that we're really good as long as the board agrees on a particular format and how you want to do things. Um, that's what will get put into the RFP. So we should be all set with that. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to see a solution for the things that I questions about the multi-family unit uh, well that's that's part of the actually that's part yeah. of the RFP that I just drafted I, I did a kind of a baseline draft and and I I also I put in you know how much is it going to cost for a 10 yard dumpster how much for this how much for this so that's what we're going to talk about later on tonight okay and um, I also um, tabled um, the selectmen's reports and the town manager reports because I don't want us to be here till midnight. So that will save us a good half hour of discussion as well. So, um, but I'm really glad these guys could come. Um, I think it gave us a lot of information and I know there's um, one of our citizens is, has had multiple spills on his street and is not happy. So um, the fact that Jay brought that up was a great um, point because it looks like they have either minimized or eliminated that and if they if it does spill it looks like they are very responsive to um, taking care of those issues so that's good so I was just doing some simple math yeah do one barrel one barrel for each resident is a hundred and sixty thousand dollars what did they say it was fifty fifty dollars per barrel per barrel yeah so, and, and as you know, he said that we can get into lease programs and, and purchase right. and all this other stuff. But I wanted to get as much information to all of you guys on the board as no, possible. I, no, I, I, um, I do understand that. It, yeah. So, so it, it, but it's a know, reasonable, I mean, it's a, a sizable investment. It is. For it these is. Barrels. It yep. is. Yes. So, can yes. you take a seat right here at one of these chairs? Okay. <laughs> Hi, guys. <laughs> Yep, right yep. here is fine. Yep, and you please introduce yourself. Sure. Um, first off, thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, Madam it's Board. my pleasure to have you here. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm Pete Lasher now with Waste Management. Okay. Um, I have a card for the book if you uh, put a crest on it. If you want, I'll give them a way out. Perfect. Um, been with Waste Management 18 years. And for the record, first off, thank you for serving because I sit in your shoes for the city of Rochester. I'm a city councilor. Oh. So you know, you, you feel our pain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all righty then. All right, good. But from the bottom of my hat, thank you, because I know it takes a lot of time. This is my, I gotta get a life. This is my ninth term as a city councilor in Rochester. But you know what, it's just me at home. Well, I should say my son's there, but he's 26, so he's not there. Yeah. So it gives me something to do and it helps <laughs> with my job, because I, I sit in your shoes. I know what you're going through. But waste management, 
Well, we're a national company. In fact, we did the town of uh, Plastow probably about 10, 15 years ago. And then I think you guys jumped to go to uh, JRM. Right. And I was sitting uh, over the weekend thinking about, you know, should I do a PowerPoint presentation and bore people? I said, no, I want to have a conversation with you. And I mean, I know you've heard of waste management. I don't know if you guys, if you folks were around when we did service the town. But uh, we have 17 different market areas throughout the country. Uh, in our market area here in New England, just in New Hampshire alone, we have an, uh, what we call a trucking or hauling office in Keene, Londonderry, New Hampton, and Rochester. So the town would be serviced more than likely out of Rochester or Londonderry, one of the two sites. Our site in Rochester is migrating to all CNG trucks, compressed natural gas, mm -hmm. better efficiency and environmental impact. That process is ongoing right now. But with waste management, you know, you look at every other company out there, and I'm not here and to badmouth any other. I know the gentleman. I see him at every bid that I go to, and they're good guys from Casala. I know Lou Russell from Cascade, but we buy carts from his company. But I think the similarities with waste management and the others, really, we're pretty much all the same. But what sets us, I think, apart from really everyone else is the investment in technology that goes into our trucks. That's where the similarity stops. The information and the stuff that we have in our trucks like onboard computing, which is basically real-time data that allows our driver to stay in constant communication with dispatch. We also have GPS devices in our trucks. And this is key too because 99% of the calls that we get, you miss me, and we, they're human, there mm -hmm. have been missed pickups, is the weight put out. With our GPS device, we say, well, you know, not that we wouldn't come back and get it over the next day, but by, <laughs> I guess, ordinance, most towns usually have to have it out by 7 a.m. because yeah. that's when the trucks start. Yeah. But so we have the tracking. We said, no, Mrs. Smith, we were on your street at, you know, at, at 8.05. And people get used to their current hauler coming at different times and that's when they kind of set it out if it's at noon or after they can sleep in a little bit and then put it out so that's what we find and um, uh, again with the technology that's where the similarities stop the other I think driving factor is in you know I think every company is looks at this but is safety right I mean that's paramount in our business I mean we pride ourselves on um, what we call our initiative mission to zero. We want zero incidences or accidents. We have 10 critical rules. In fact, I was down here, maybe it was April. I decided to take a ride and look at the, your current hauler and just to see what they were using for equipment, just to get an idea of what, what's going on. And uh, they do things that we wouldn't do. And I've seen other vendors do the same thing, what we call zigzagging going down the street and going across. They do it because it's quicker and they're able to, you know, get the routes on quicker, but it's unsafe practice. We go down one side of the street, unless it's a dead end, then we'd probably have to, you know, back in and then get both sides. But if it's Main Street, we'd go down one end, turn around and come back up. Uh, another uh, critical rule that we have, if we use the rear load truck, uh, if they back down the street and the driver is still on the back and the driver is backing up, well, both of them, if they're caught, because we do, you know, uh, we have guys in our operations that observe the driver's not to hound them to see if they're doing, but it's a teaching moment and to make sure that they're following the critical rules. So if they do that, you know, they'd be looking, unfortunately, for a new job because it's, it's a safety issue that if you're backing that big truck up, there's a lot of blind spots. We want one guy on the ground waving, looking, and the other guy driving. If it's a one-man truck, there's cameras and stuff, but usually uh, if we use a real loader, that's, that's part of their job. And again, with the town, it's really not what we want to drive, what we want to push to see the town do. It's what you want to do, right? It's waste management does it all. We do automated. We do okay. manual collection like you all do right. now. Okay. So it depends on really your goals and what you want as a town. You have taken some proactive steps uh, by doing a barrel slash bag limit. And my hat's off to you for doing that. That actually helped 
Uh, and yeah, they can, I guess, buy for $2, I think I read, an extra sticker for extra bags. I believe that's yeah, what I read. Yes. Yeah. Well, they can, but yeah. they don't always. They, yeah. So, so that, I guess that brings me to a question is, could you tell us a little bit more about your training program for your employees? Vigorous training program. When we onboard a new employee, they go down for, we send them to, well, with COVID, we're not sending them down there. We're, we're doing it more local. We had to revamp. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they go for a six-week training program okay. on the waste management ways. And then we have daily briefings in the morning and, and at least minimum <coughs> once a month of a training, be it some type of video in the summertime, days like we had the last week, heat exhaustion, make sure you hydrate. Just simple things to remind our guys to make sure they have it. But the training, again, is, is paramount what we do. And like I said, I'm not, your current vendor, you know, they're picking it up, but I'm not sure if there's been any complaints, but some of the practices we don't do as far, but as far as the training, again, they go away for six, uh, six weeks, okay. come back, and then they go with a senior guy, you know, say if we had this town currently, if this was gonna be his route, he would go with one of our senior trainers, if you will, okay. to observe the route, get, get his hands or her hands dirty, and learn the route that way. And then we finally, probably after a month and a half, two months, uh, or more than that, about two months, we you know cut the, cut the cord, if you will, and, <laughs> and send them on their way. Okay. Bye. Right. Can you also speak to us a little bit about your vehicle maintenance programs? Maintenance programs, they are, mm -hmm. well, first off, when, and I'm glad you're going out to bid. In fact, you're a little bit behind the eight ball already because we're gonna buy new equipment. For, for this job, right? We have spares, but that's what they are, spares for other communities that we service. So we're buying, it would be probably two brand new CNG trucks. Um, but when we order those, and we have a lot more buying power than pretty much any other vendor, it still takes us a year to 14 months to secure. Well, think about it, when the town buys a fire truck, yep, exactly. you don't just well, take yeah. that red one over there, it takes about a year. You know, once they order it, they, we do the same thing. And then once we get them, then we install our equipment, our on-screen, our on-board computing, the GPS, all the stuff that we implement takes other time as well. But the maintenance uh, starts at the beginning of the day where the driver does a, a pre-check, yeah, pre-route yeah. and a post-route at the end of the day. Looks for any leaks and, uh, again, I don't, you know, know exactly all the, the 52 points that they hit, but they check, each one has to be checked off and signed off by a supervisor before they leave and then when they come back. So they're done. And then anything breaks down, we have our own maintenance shop right at uh, Turnkey Landfill to fix. Sometimes we get more than we can handle. We might sub some of that work out, but very rarely. Okay. Um, how much lead time um, would you need to transfer to our service if we awarded you a bid? Well, how much time? Typically, I mean, we could start, you know, right away, but if I have to go out, my company has to go out and rent equipment. Just for an example, I had a couple of communities go out to bid in April, and some even May for a July 1 start date. And I just mentioned, it takes me a year to get new mm -hmm, equipment. Mm -hmm. I, I, if it's a one or two day job, I might have some spare equipment I can use, but this is a five day a week. You know, we'd look at rerouting maybe a couple of streets just to equalize tonnage. But typically we could start right away, but if I have to go out and rent a vehicle or two, well, I'm not gonna absorb that cost, I can't. You, right. Ultimately right. you guys will. That's right. why I, I'm out in front of, and I was prior to your arrival, sir, I was, um, Mr. Fitzgerald, I believe, or Fitz, what was it, Fitzgerald? Yes, Sean Fitzgerald. Yes, yes. he was here, and I, I had the same discussion with him about the lead time on mm -hmm. trucks that, you know, you need to go out to bid now. And I'm mm -hmm. glad you're talking, but, I mean, the sooner you pull the trigger, you know, the, the better. I mean, mm -hmm. if you were to go out to bid and award it to me tomorrow, and, you know, could I start next Monday? Well, probably not. You know, I, mm -hmm. I would need, you know, probably three months because i got to hire someone. Uh, yeah. you know, well, I think equipment. we're a little bit ahead of it because our contract doesn't expire till next June. Next June, so 30th, so yeah. we got about a year to play with this. Yes, so we're do. good. Okay. Yes, you do, and I'm glad that you're yeah. you're looking okay. at this now because it yeah. is serious. And and I'll touch no. on something else real quick. And I think sir, yeah, I got a Julie, question. Yeah. Like we implemented a policy of limiting the barrels per household or whatever. And then we have the multi-households. Maybe there's three apartments in the building or something. Which that means that there would be 
the two barrels per, so six. Yeah. Do you use RFD, RFID scanners to see how many barrels you're picking up at a certain location? I mean, we have so that, that technology. So you can enforce that limit? It, well, we do, right? If you have, again, we, we're going to go with what the town tells us to pick up. If we're awarded this, if you say, you know, any apartment complex, you know, five or under, you need to service. So we'll know. They can count. They're going to look. Uh, there are RFD chips on there, and there's equipment. We've experimented with this in Lynn Mass and provided them data, and that data was, yeah. they did nothing with it. it, well, it they did nothing can, with I it. I can see, you could, if, they per, if you're getting the barrel from the town, we know which RFID IDs, numbers, go to which unit or households. Yeah. Therefore, yeah. you can track how much, you only be able to pick up the trash from the ones that are authorized, not someone that went out and bought one third party and stuck it in front of their house. Right, and, and we'll, we'll know the difference. Typically, yeah. if, Again, if the town goes with the car, right, it's a great system. The city of Rochester, my hometown, I'm a city council there, and that was a fun discussion. I had to recuse <laughs> myself when they went to that, but it was interesting. But we went to the fully automated, so that's uh, a, a, a barrel for trash and a barrel for the recycling. Mm -hmm. uh, aesthetically, it looks great. Uh, will you get pushback? No matter what you do, you're going to get pushback, right? I, I sit and I know, I've seen it, I live it. but. You know, I had people from, oh, my elderly mom won't be able to wield that down. My mom's 78 years old, has a little bit of mobility issues, but that wheel cart, she can wheel it right out, not a problem. I try to do it for her, but I'm not always around. I'm on the road a lot or in my own meetings. So, but the carts are easy to navigate and, and go. So you're going to get pushback on people, oh, I'm not going to have, you already took a step by that two bag, two barrel limit. Now you're taking the next step, either a pay as you throw, which is a true user-based program, it right? Is, yeah. It's like electricity. You pay for what you use. So so do you provide um, the actual carts as well? We, we can do that. Okay. I tell communities you can, you can either A, buy them yourself. You, you know, if we buy them, own them, and maintain them, we've done it that way too. So uh, we can lease them from you. Yeah, yeah, we lease them. In a normal wear and tear, if they break, and they will, 10, 15, 20 years, I've seen them last longer. But, the, you know, lids will break, a wheel will come off. We'll fix that. If a resident took a baseball bat to it intentionally, though well, that's his or her fault, and right. they'll be right. responsible for right. that. But typically you're not going to see that. But And the other key thing is some people, I see Lou left you uh, some carts. Some people think when they move that the cart goes with them. It, no. it doesn't. No. It, it needs to stay. And there is a serial, mm -hmm. uh, either an RFD, but a serial number yep. that is associated yep. with that house. But the other thing that the town really needs to think about, too, is the industry's changed, right? I'm not sure what you're currently paying for, or if anything. If you're not paying anything right now, you've got a sweetheart deal, and that's going away in recycling. Trust me, we're paying. <laughs> okay. Well, with the recycling market, right? I mean, I have communities paying 130 plus, mm -hmm. you know, depending on the market and where they are. And it's expensive. Mm -hmm. But in the very near future, because of disposal capacity, especially in the Northeast, that 130, 140 is going to look very attractive because disposal mm -hmm. prices are going to start going through the roof. Yeah. Uh, going yeah. through the roof, and there's a crunch. There's three or four landfills that closed. The last one was Taunton landfill in Mass. I think it was February of this year. So if you look at that one, it's the last one that I was aware of, and even going back about eight, nine years, the Northeast has lo has lost over two million. Uh, cubic yards of disposal capacity. Wow. And incinerators, North Andover, Wheel Abrader, and uh, Covanta, they're pretty much Next at out. or yeah. above capacity right now. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Eco Main up in Portland, which would be a hike to get your stuff all the way up there. But mm -hmm. okay. So there is a capacity issue. Okay. All right. Um, gentlemen, do you have any further questions? No. Wow, that was good. All right. Well, thank you so much for your presentation, for giving us some different information that we have received uh, besides the other vendors tonight. And if you could leave your card I with um, Beth, that would be great. And we will be getting back in touch with you if you have any more questions. Yes. And question for you, though. 
Yeah. When do you anticipate going out to bid? I know it's going to be a process to write Well, uh, we're, we're going to discuss the components of the RFP later on at this meeting tonight. Okay. We'd like to have something out by August so that the bid is awarded in September in time for our budget season. Good. Um, so we have, we have, I think, plenty of time to discuss, and hopefully the vendors will have plenty of time to prepare because, as I said, we our contract expires June 30th of 2021. So that, I think, gives everybody a chance to it make does. intelligent decisions. It does, it does and right. I look forward to yes. uh, receiving that. Right. Again, I know the other vendors, too, if you have questions, you feel free. We're a resource. All right. You know, please, any questions? All right. right. Thank you so much. You. We My appreciate pleasure, your, your Thank Enjoy you. the rest of your meeting. Thank you. We, we always do. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least some of us do. I don't know. <laughs> I have a night off after this. Tomorrow night, usually Tuesday nights are my meetings. There you so go. Off. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, folks. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Down, no, downstairs. Thanks again. Uh, Thank you. All right. <sighs> okay. So. Um, if any of you think of any more questions down the road, I know it's a little bit rushed, but we do have plenty of time to prepare the RFP with exactly, you know, what information that you're looking for on it. Um, so before we go to the next topic, the next topic is to discuss, um, Crazy. Yes. I just have a question. Are we yeah. going to have, um, our current provider come in and do a presentation? Um, I did not ask him to do it. Um, however, if you'd like, I would be very happy to schedule him at another meeting. Um, but it was, I guess it was my thought that we already know the devil that we do know. So it was the devils that we don't that we wanted to get information right. from. But if you want, I'd be happy to do well, that. I just, I didn't know what the other members of the board what thought do you think? about yeah, having him come in. Yeah. Do you want to have JRM come in? Okay. Um, I'm not sure if I can get him in two weeks, but I'll, I'll try. But if not, first week of August. All right. Does he provide automated? Um, I believe he does, but I think on a limited basis. So that's one of the questions that we would need to ask him. So um, I'll take care of that for you guys. And I'll try to get him in here as quickly as I can. All right. Um, so next item on the agenda is awarding assessing contracts. And I think we just opened them up tonight. And each one of you has a copy. There were four bids. And so I'd love for you guys to just take a look at them over the next couple of weeks. And I would like to have... Um, a decision for awarding the assessing contract at our next meeting on the 27th, and that will give that vendor an opportunity to, to prepare as well because their contract will start January 1st, all right? And that gives them a little bit of time, plus it'll give us some information um, for budgeting purposes. Okay, so um, next item on the agenda is discussing the RFP for the trash, and I wanna publicly commend and thank Jay for all his hard work in helping me to put 90% of the RFP together. He's working full time and he's got little kids in the house and he still managed to put together a really outstanding and very detailed RFP. They're not um, so little. But pardon? They're not so little, but. No. Well, <laughs> but still, they're kids, yeah. are, kids are a yeah. handful, yeah. But, but I really want to, I thank you so much because he is a brand new selectman and he just jumped in with both feet and, and I really appreciate his help, so thank you very much for doing that. Um, some of the questions that we will need to discuss within the confines of that RFP. First question is, um, how long do you want the contract? Um, do you want a three year with a two year extension or do you want a five year? What, what would you guys like to do? Because that's gonna have to be part of the RFP. Open for discussion. Do we have a legal limit by RSA? Um, no, actually, I, I looked that up, and they said that you could engage into a 40-year contract, but okay. that's a little Can beyond Can we get options? Yeah. No, get options no, on both? Um, would you, all right, so you want both? You want three years with a two-year extension and a five-year with costs? I, is that going to dissuade could. people from bidding if we make the RFP too complicated? It, it, well, from all the contracts that I did look at, and I looked at about a half a dozen of them from various towns, mm -hmm. it appeared to me that the longer the contract, the more cost effective it was because yeah. they can guarantee, you know, I've got five years of, of work. And I know we had some issues in this town with JRM either extending or rewriting. Right. So I, I guess my th my personal opinion is, is I would like to look at a five-year contract, but if you guys think you want to do both, just let me know, but I need a consensus from you guys. I I'd like to- I would have would be the five years that you make it stuck for five years. Yeah, I, I yeah. would much, more, much rather go with a three-year with a two-year extension. 
Okay. We're happy after three years, we continue it for, 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 for an additional two years. All right. Um, things change too much. Yeah, things too change quickly. drastically yeah. in, in yeah. three to five years. Okay, so what, what are your thoughts, John and oh, Julie? I'd, I'd like, I, I was thinking the five years at first because I want to see some stability. We don't want to go through this all the time because <laughs> yeah. it's, yep. it's a big money decision. Yep. And also you don't want to make a wrong decision, but if you have three and you find out you don't like the service, you don't have to keep it after three. Right. So, but the two-year extension can still give you the stability. The five years. You can make it five years. Right. Long as the long as that extension is, you can't change the price in that extension. Right. It's a still set okay. price. So, right. three, so essentially, it is a five-year, but it gives you the out in three years if you don't like them. All right, John, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, I agree with that. Three plus two. Jay, did you seem like you were kind of leaning in that direction as well? or? And that's fine. I mean, that, you just need to I, tell me what you want me to write in this, and I have no problem with that. I guess my my thing about it would be the the cost savings. Like, is there is there going to be a significant cost if we go the five over a three? You know, it's we won't know that. Um, so I I'd probably go five, but if they're willing to give us both, you know, it. it you want me to try that to try to do I, the three plus two? It, it just gives us more options to look at. You know, All right. it, yeah. we can. You, can. you can write the uh, contract, the RFP, to, for a bid alternate, and that means you can do both. Okay. You can say, give us a price for right. five. Give us a price for three with the two year with the two one year extensions. Right. Okay. And then they will price it out. Okay. And then you can decide. Yep. All right. Yeah, you see the savings, and if you want to go with five to save X amount of dollars, or if you want to go with three to have an option to look at it. Okay. Yep, that's All right. good. All right. So we have the best of both worlds yeah, then. Best okay, both worlds. great. All right. So that's taken care of. Okay. So now the next um, decision that we need to make is: um, Do you guys want to go with an automated program, an automated cart program, as opposed to a manual pickup? It's I, hard to answer that question without knowing yeah, what the right. cost was, and they gave gave us no indication whatsoever. I mean, they could have said, "Yes, it's less expensive." All we heard was, "Yeah, there's less labor," but that didn't translate to what what is the cost. And it's different for each town. Exactly. You know. And I, ideally, it being automated, yes, I can see that that might save money, but I don't know that it's going to. It it. Right. It's probably a lot cleaner, but you don't see it. Most of the time when they're picking up the trash, you don't see the pick up the trash. Whether they're can't throwing it in the back or whether they're doing it automated, you're really not going to see that. Well, can't ahead, we, wait a minute. John, go ahead. Again, can we ask for that in the bid, the difference? I mean, you do a bid alternate for that also. Yeah. For Give us a bid with and without. Versus cart. Yeah. All right. We can't make the decision without the numbers. Exactly. I agree. Correct, correct. Uh, um, I will tell you, though, that the um, track committee recommended by a vote of four to one to go with the automated program. And um, I don't know how often you guys drive around and look at them, but I, I have to tell you, Atkinson is immaculate all the time. They like you it. will not have the yeah. problem of um, all, you know, the junk that we see out here and overspilling barrels and and just literally trash all over the streets because they will n literally not pick up stuff that is not in those barrels. And I mean, I, I personally would not be unopposed to paying a little bit more to have our town look good and clean and neat because when people drive through this town, they judge our town on how it looks. And sometimes it doesn't look too pretty. And I'm going to be very blunt and honest about that. And if we could make some inroads into making sure that um, it does look presentable and, and clean looking, I think sometimes that's worth the cost. But that's just my opinion. And it also gives you some control because if, let's say, if it's not in the approved barrel exactly. that maybe says plastic on it, get it doesn't up. get picked up. So people right. don't put out right. seven bags. Right. <laughs> And unfortunately, yeah, yeah. I mean, we do have a memorandum of understanding with JRM, but, uh, and it's, it's more just as much our fault as anybody else's that we're not enforcing it. And so in this instance, this will almost be a self-enforcement of the rules. Yeah. So go ahead, um, Greg. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're putting out the contract. How do we pay for this? We're, we're putting out an RFP and, and they're gonna come back, come back it, it is a budget item. Yes. Budget. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so here's so so that's what I was thinking. So my 
comments are the following. Um, there is a, a very critical perspective of what the budget should be and for us to say, yeah, we should go to an automated and it could be a more costly proposal with these barrels, how are we going to be able to pass that in the budget? I'm concerned. Okay, and that's the next part of the next question that I okay. did want to talk to you guys about too. Um, as far as um, the budget is concerned, I believe, and Mar, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, we, we must put in the first year's cost within our budget, but because of Sanbornizing, we have to let the taxpayers know the cost of multiple year contracts like the assessing contract and our trash contract because they need to know what they're going to be paying for. So currently we're paying a little over three quarters of a million dollars for our trash contract this year. So that brings me to my next question. I can do the alternate bid on you on that. Now the next thing that we, I will put this out as both ways as well, but um, we have to make decisions on whether we want to recycle because we're paying a little over $39,000 a month for recycling, and um, if you use the tipping fees, which is the amount of trash tonnage, um, I think we would save um, about $273,000 if it was just trash and using tipping fees. So I'm gonna look at both of those issues too, but that's a decision we have to make, and I know it's blasphemy and I know it, because I've been recycling since I was 21 years old, 70 years ago. And, and nobody caught that, but that's okay. <laughs> All right, yeah, you can laugh now. All right, but but anyway, and, and I, I, I really am very, you know, conscientious about recycling, but, you know, in light of um, people struggling to get back to work and taking a financial pounding this year because of the COVID-19, we have to be really sensitive about some of these issues. And um, that gentleman said something very appropriate you know, the, the, the cost for recycling is not gonna go down anytime soon. So that's gonna be probably our worst decision that we're gonna have to make is do we include recycling or just do straight trash well, pickup? Because that's gonna cost a lot I think less what he said too. is the place for landfills was gonna go up because they're right, getting and yeah. scarce. Yes. So if you don't, if you, if you have all regular trash, no trash, that cost is gonna skyrocket based on the trend because there's no place to dump it. Well, if we have a contract with just straight tipping yeah. fees, that, that's what we're gonna have to figure out, and that's why Why don't we're we have the option to give them, they stuff. can give us a price on both. Well, yeah, one, that's, and that's what we will, out. but I'm just giving yeah. you the heads up that you're gonna have to make that decision. Go ahead, Mark, yeah. and then I'll let you talk to you. One of the things that you have to take into consideration is what we're experiencing now is that there is so much activity at home where people are working from home instead of going to work, they're eating at home instead of going out, that there's more, more tonnage that's going to be created with trash prospectively into next year yep. with this COVID, with, if this keeps on going like I think mm -hmm. it's going to go, yep. mm -hmm. your tonnage is going to go higher. People are even buying groceries online now, so that's more packaging and boxes and stuff that's ending up in the trash. Yeah, well, th those packaging and boxes are usually recyclable materials, but if, you, if you're doing recycling. Do it the right way. Go ahead, Jay. But uh, Mark brought up a good point earlier, and the guy Casella kind of talked about it, was the adjusting of those fees yes. so now that's being built into contracts so we could yes. add that to the contract so that we're not going to get pulled over the coals well, when we're actually, recycling i will yeah. tell you that atkinson has that and i have their contract so i already know um that it, with a certain amount and I, I can't remember exactly how it works because i read it a little while ago but if you have a certain amount they pay you Mm -hmm. And if you go over that, you have to pay them. So it is a little bit of a gambling game, but but yes, and, and I will, I'll pull that out of the contract too, so I can um, put that in there if you would like. Right. Um, so let me just review what you guys want us to do here, what you want me to put in there. Um, you wanna do um, an alternate bid for a three plus two year versus a five year contract. You want me to do an alternate bid for um, manual pickup versus cart pickup. And then you want me to also do um, pricing on straight trash pickup and um, bi-monthly recycling, correct? Well, I think uh, it, was, it was all no recycling at all yeah, straight contract. Yeah, straight trash pickup. And the one and you have recycling trash. trash. Recycling. Okay, is yeah. there any other stuff that you want uh, us to add in there? 
to make sure we give these guys as much information as we can. Giving them a lot of work too. Do we include in, in this the cost of the carts? Yes, I had that in there anyway. Yeah, I had that in there anyway. And also we should do purchase versus lease. Well, that's, yes. that's why I was saying yep. from, the, from the bid, yep. basically we wanna know if you guys provide the carts, what does it cost? If we buy the carts, what, what, is, what does it cost? All right, so did you wanna purchase or do you wanna lease or do you want both? Depends on what it costs. Want to do both? All right, you guys, it's, it's going to be like a, it's going to be like this. You guys are going to have it's some really about. tough decisions to make, but I think the more information Once we get, get the better. Once you get information, it'll take more yeah. than a meeting just to see through what, what yep. the Yeah, Absolutely. Are. Well, that's why I'm hoping that if we can put the bid out by August, we should have some kind of reasonable assurances of what it's going to cost us so that, you know, when we prepare the budget in September, we'll have some kind of an idea. And hopefully, Mark, that will give you enough time to do that, too. Go ahead, Jay. I'm sorry. A uh, couple questions. Yep. Uh, so the, the carts themselves, are we going to go out to an outside vendor to provide the carts, or are we going to work through one of these well, vendor, we trash should, vendors to purchase the carts? We should get all the information. Now, I'm going to ask both these vendors what it would cost to purchase and or lease their carts. And I'm also going to go back to Lou and say, OK, what is it going to cost for us to buy these outright from you and do the comparison? What, what did, that, did Atkinson do? Um, they leased theirs. They leased the better. Yes, yes. And, and obviously, it's not such a big upfront cost um, to do that. But I think the lease is kind of like forever. And right. so that's the, that's the downside is do you want to do a front end loaded cost or not? But we won't know that until the we see the lease has the benefit if things get broken, they replace them. Yes. Or they yeah. wear out. It, yeah. There's it, no, there's no cost coming out of the woodwork when you have a bad but, storm or whatever. But for, but for the cots lasting 20 ten, years, yeah, or even 10, 10 or years, for that matter, years, yeah. You, you might even consider us taking out the loan to pay for the carts yeah. and pay it and pay it back that yeah. way. Yeah. And, and all, a long-term lease where they're getting the benefit of the longevity exactly. of those cards. We're not. Exactly. Well, they lease gonna, because they're getting the, your business. The nose, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And, and that's the other issue, too, is if you lease a, a cart from the vendor, if you all decide in three to five years that you don't want that vendor anymore, then you're going to do that all over again. Whereas if you purchase them outright, you, you, it's like, well, I'm just going to use it with no matter which vendor I use. So th those are all these things that we have to think about and consider. Go ahead, Jay. And the last question I had was um, it, included in the RFP, do we need to list the number of single family households? I had that in apartment there. Apartment complexes. I do have it in there, yep. Multifamily. And I, yep, I okay. had that all in there, and I'm going to double check it. I, I put out a, a, an email to Mary Beth Walker to give us an updated list, mm -hmm. and um, I will reaffirm those numbers with her. And I also asked for um, a 10 yard dumpster, a cost of that for you know the, the multifamily homes and that type yeah. of thing. Well, I want a solution. I, I want to see a solution for those that there is a recycling right. solution. Then just yeah. dump it all in the dumpster. Uh, yeah, I because know. we have a lot of those units, and it ends now, up. I will tell you that when I was a chair of the track committee, yeah. I actually went and sent letters to all of these multifamily <laughs> homes, and not one um, eight one group did anything except for one person, one one group on West Pine. So we're not going to. You know, we, we're, we're not going to be able to force them to recycle, but we certainly can look at, yeah. you know, what it's going to cost to have well, them I think put like things in the dumpsters. Uh, Casella had it seemed like they had some solutions, and because they, they say they've dealt with these issues before, yep. maybe there's a the way they do that or implement or it. Maybe they have two ba two things, two two dumpsters or whatever. Yeah. I don't know how they do it. Yeah, and I I didn't. I'm sorry, Jay. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I'm good. Um, go ahead, no. Greg. Um, so the question I have is. In the research that was done to put, to put this initial proposal together, do we have to, should we in, be included in our task list for specific ordinances that we would have to change or write to, to do the do's and don'ts? Do you know, you know what I'm saying? In other words, do we, if we're going to put this programming out, it's, it's going to be the town ordinance saying this is how we're going to be doing are dumping, and this is the rules. So do we have to modify the, the town code and ordinance to be able to support uh, this? Uh, um, do we have a trash ordinance? I don't know, I don't know if we do. That's in your purview to do that. You can create an ordinance, and you can, have, you can enforce it like you do the other ordinances. OK. It's under your purview. Yeah, go ahead, Jay. It, it, unless anyone has anything else to say. Got that. Um, one of the things I, I've seen in other towns is that they've 
Go out in extra dumpsters to have a extra recycling drop off area. Is that something we want to consider for the town? And do we have an area where we could drop a dumpster know, that people, idea. you know, on the weekends they could, if they have a bunch of extra, they could just drive in and drop it off. You know, I, I, I've seen it in other towns and it, and it worked, but I don't know if we're opening up a transfer station and you're getting into, you know, all other. We could inquire. It's not going to hurt to ask. But, but that's a good idea. You know, if people have, are struggling to have places to drop, like in a multifamily or an apartment building, at least we have an off-site place that they can take their recycling to and unload it. How do you, you monitor know, it? If they can't recycle. do it within, you know, like a lot of these, like some apartment buildings, they might have, um, you know, an HOA where you can only put one dumpster there and you're not going to be able to put another dumpster next to it or something like that. I'm just, I don't know for sure, but that might be yeah. a possibility. Yeah, but at can. least you have an off-site place someone could go drop their recycling instead of dragging it up to the edge of the road or something like that. And I'm going to guess and i'm going to ask mark about this but do you think the the landfill would be an appropriate place or would that be just inviting trouble because we would have to look at an area to put that in well first. you don't know what they're going to put in it It'll well no you wouldn't leave it monitored. it would have to be monitored yeah you wouldn't leave it open to right. free will right yeah who's going to monitor you know, you, it would be like the um uh the brush debris and, the brush yes, and stuff like right. that you would have specific times that it would be open or Oh, okay. You have a dumpster up there so that when people go drop off brush, there's also a recycling dumpster, for so, example. All right. I can certainly ask about that. Okay. So the last question you guys have to answer for me is, and that was what Greg had brought up earlier, was um, white goods and bulk pickup. Right now, we're doing one bulk pickup per week. In the past several years ago, I remember we did a spring bulk pickup and a fall bulk pickup. So how would you guys like me to structure that how would you like to do that do you want to do it twice a year do you want to do it every week um i know white goods are a totally separate animal and they have to be you know each white good has to have a cost to it and that's across the board with every vendor but what about like say, mattresses white and, goods, what do you mean by um, refrigerators oh, okay, computers okay. things like that and they will have definitions when they whoever wins the bid will give us a contract with their list of what definitions are and oh, okay. what's acceptable but usually the white goods are that go ahead jay so like the bulk pickup that would be you know it if we went with the manual solution, that would obviously have more opportunity for the weekly bulk item that we have now, right? The automated might not have that. It might be more of a by you know twice a year type of thing. Right. Um, so I I guess it would have to be into the RFP. You know if uh, you know twice a year. What are your options? Yeah. Hmm? Huh? Do twice a year, spring and fall, because yeah. right. If we went to automated, then they couldn't pick up. A yeah, there's couch. no way. You right, know, it would almost have to be a special a delivery. Yeah. Right. Isn't the RM right now? It's by appointment only. Well, for white goods, yes, but okay. not for bulk, for bulk pickup. pickup. Bulk pickup, people can leave mattresses out every week. Yeah. And they'll pick them up. And they pick, them, pick them up. up. In some yeah. places I've seen, it seems like they had it out there every week. <laughs> I think you're right. And I think the rest of the town's paying I for it, I think you're too. right. I think you're absolutely right. There's some places right. they got stuff. I don't even know where they get all of it. There's so much out in front of yeah. certain And buildings. I think John, John made a... I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Just to kind of amplify what we just talked about, should we consider a pay-as-you-go? In other words, that each resident would pay for any additional yeah, for the bulk stuff yeah bulk maybe stuff. they should be pay as you go and then just the regular trash is what set off off of the process and basically they just give us a schedule saying this is what but we what still have to make an arrangement with right. the vendor as far as do you pick it up every week or do you pick it up um semi-annually that's i guess my big question is do you want bulk it d doesn't matter whether we pay as we throw that can be another level down yeah, but well, we still I mean, have to find yeah. out from the vendor if they're able and willing to do it either every week or twice a right. year. The, impo the important thing is it redu reduces the price of the contract to mm -hmm. the rest of the town. And, and I think twice a year, w the town's paying for more of that than, than the residents are. And, and so if the residents are paying for their bulk goods, it should be more frequent. It should be every other month or something like that. Yeah. Or by appointment only. Yeah. I mean, okay. That's the best uh, way uh, I can uh, all right. like, I have something. Here's my schedule. It's going to cost me $100. 
I call up the waste company, they schedule a date, and I make sure my thing is at oh, the curb, all right. and they so, pick up, and they and pay, I pay for that it. price. Yeah. So is that what you're saying is they can make their own personal arrangements with the vendor? Right. Right. Okay, all right, that, that could be a possibility. I think the we responsibility could, of town should just be the that. regular trash, not, okay. not the other things that come up with right. certain units or whatever. Okay. Because why is everybody why does why does everybody have to pay for it? Right. All right. Okay. That's an interesting point. Go ahead, Jay. Um, I, I believe Casella mentioned something about a transfer station. I don't know where it was located, but would that give us the ability to have residents drive up there to drop stuff? I believe it's in Hampstead, and I think you're absolutely right because I know Atkinson does that. Um, they can bring their own goods up, and then I guess the only. Thing, problem that I had is, you know, you are so not going to put a mattress in my sports car. You're not <laughs> going to do that. So, yes, they, people can take advantage of that, and I believe they can do that, and I will check into that as so, well, but I'm pretty sure the transfer these, stations... In you know, do these other vendors have those capabilities? I'm sorry, what? Do those other vendors have those those type of capabilities, like another transfer station? A transfer that we station? Could, yeah. um, that we would have would access to as a, right. as a town if we contract with them. Okay. Okay, so would that be a deal breaker if they didn't? No, no, not All for right, me. That's I a just, question we can ask the vendors yeah. outright. It doesn't need to be in the RFP, but we that's can almost right, a, that's right. That's almost a separate service. All right, so if you guys... The regular can, trash is what I'm concerned with, yeah. that we have people, so there's not trash piling up yeah, in plastic. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. yeah. So, so if you, you all have any questions that you want to ask the vendors in general, could you forward them to, yeah. to either me or to Beth. I know I hate to put more work on Beth. She has enough work as it is, but give them to me and I'll just keep funneling them to the vendors. And, and as soon as they answer me, I'll share it with the board. But uh, um, I have my work cut out for me. So I might be calling you again, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> and when Casella was Breaking up, I on. never even asked them if they had the RFID sensors for the barrels. <laughs> um, uh, they do. They do. Yeah. It's in their literature. It is in their literature. It is in their literature, yeah. Right. Yeah, so. One last question. Sure, do you have sure. Any do you have the actual cost that Atkinson's paying for their new trash contract? I do. You do? Okay. I don't think we're supposed to have it, though. <laughs> um, really I'm not sure. I, well, I guess it is public knowledge, but I, yes, I, I guess can the thing do that. I'm in, I'm, two things that I'm interested in that. One is they are relatively population-wise the yep. same size as us, yes. so th th we're probably comparable. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I want to know if they're getting any benefit of collecting recyclables so we can compare our manual pickup to the price they're paying for our automated pickup with recyclables yeah and we can understand whether that's a lower cost or a higher cost yes. right now i have no indication whatsoever right. yeah I whether can, it's worthwhile to let me see if i can dig that up for you separate it because yep. i know i have it somewhere in my voluminous correspondence yes <laughs> um yes they John. made the switch from manual yes water. yes right. they would know what the cost yes is. and and i actually <laughs> at, public cost. at, public at my track meeting i had mr alan fear who was a town administrator he came down and gave us a presentation on casella and he answered a whole bunch of these questions and he was incredibly complimentary about his, um, Atkinson being able to work very well with Casella, and he had nothing but wonderful things to say about them. Um, but as far as the nuts and bolts about getting the dollar amount, um, let me see if I can get that to you guys. All right, and I'll try, I'm gonna just email it to you guys, all right? <coughs> okay, any more stuff I need to do for you? You want to read back everything we just said? No, <laughs> look at look at look at what I've given. Look at what I've taken for notes. I know. Oh my god! We're almost done with the trash talk. I'm I'm done. <laughs> I am so done. I know. We're really late too. So shame on me. So um, what I would like to do, if everybody is okay with this, is I'd like to approve our non-public session minutes right now. And um, unless Marky, do you want to review the water ordinance beforehand? Mark's not listening to me. I was I was not prepared to do the water. Okay, no, that's today. fine. We're doing that on, on, Monday. on Monday. Right. Okay. Well, it was on our agenda, so we can scratch that off. Um, go ahead. I have one question on that. Tim Moore sent us a very detailed yes. analysis of it with yes. suggestions. Who's going to look at whether those suggestions? Attorney are Radigan. Fit? So attorney it is going to be Attorney Radigan's going to check it out for know. us. Yep. Thank He's going to do that. And thank you, Tim, who's here and there in the background. And I want to thank you for putting all of those. Um, 
things together because it was it was very thoroughly done and very thoughtful questions. Actually, the number so, of pages of his comments yeah. was more than the ordinance. It was be yeah, it was great. So thank you, Tim. I appreciate I appreciate you looking out for us. I know. Thank you. Um, all right. So we're going to approve non-public minutes, and then after that, we are going to go into a non three non-public sessions to discuss um, Mark's contract and uh, a few other things that we're, we're going to discuss. So um, if we could do those meeting minutes right now. And again, I'm going to caution the board that if you do want to discuss anything that was sealed minutes, we have to go into a non-public session to discuss it. So what we're just going to do right now is approve the draft minutes. So I'll make a motion that we approve the June 15th session one minutes. I'll second it. Okay. Um, is there any questions on that one? That was not sealed. So any Peter. questions? No. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? All right. So that motion carries 500. Our next session is session two, which is sealed. So we. So if there's any issue with this, we, can, we, we can't discuss it until we go into... Into non-public. We're do, all we're doing is approving the, the minutes. So we're, yeah. I, uh, I'll make a motion to approve these minutes and have it remain sealed. Okay. I'll second that motion. Okay. Um, is there any further discussion on that? All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? All right. That motion carries 5-0-0. Um, session three um, is sealed minutes. I make a motion read that we approve the June 15, 2020, session three. I'll second it and need a few moments to read it. Yeah, can we read it first? Hold on. <laughs> Long one. Okay, I remember what this is about. Okay. If everybody is done reading it. I'm not that fast. You're not that fast? All right. <laughs> and did, did you motion to keep it sealed? Yes. Okay. Okay, I'm done. All right. So um, if there's no more questions or issued on this, all those in favor of, do we second that motion, Beth? And you did, yes. you did, okay. Did you say remain sealed? And remain yeah, sealed, yes. yes. Okay. okay, so all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? All right, that motion carries 5-0-0. Uh, zero, zero. Um, the last one is uh, June 15th, session four. This is also sealed. What's the last one? <clears throat> it's the last one for that date. For this oh, date, okay. sorry, yeah. I know you snuck a couple more in here on me. <laughs> That's all right. I make a motion that we approve the June 15th session four and that the minutes remain sealed. Okay. All right. May I have a second on that? Sure, if it happened that way. Right. Well, you can certainly vote no. no. I'm just trying to recall memory. Well, can I have a second on that motion? I'll second it. All right. Um, so, if there is no further discussion. Um, to vote to approve the minutes and keep them sealed. I take a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? All right, that motion carries 5 0 0. Um, next is June 29th, session one. These minutes are also sealed. I'm, 
I'll make a motion to approve these minutes and for them to remain sealed. All right. Second. Okay. Um, if there's no discussion, I'll take a vote on that. Aye. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, abstain. All right, that motion carries 500. And the last one is session two for June 29th, which is also sealed. Okay. I'm going to make a motion that we approve the June 29th, 2020 session two and that the minutes remain sealed. All right, a second on that, please. I'll second it. All righty. All those in favor? Uh, aye. 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 Do you have a question, Julian? No, well, my question was whether it should remain sealed. It should remain sealed, um, yes, because it deals with um, reputation. a sensitive subject. <laughs> all right, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. aye. All right, that motion carries 5 zero, 0 All right, so most of our business is done, and Mark just wants to talk to us a little bit about so there's a memo in your package um, about uh, Plastow Public Safety Revolving Fund. And I apologize for not getting this to you sooner. It has come to my attention that our funds are plentiful in that account. And um, we're gearing up for a construction season. And uh, we've previously, previously bought from the, uh, the outside detail fund is bought from the town vehicles. And the vehicles bring in a, a significant amount of revenue, sometimes $2,400 to $3,000 a week when the vehicles are out. Um, there's times where there's not enough vehicles to go out. And we're not even in the prime time of the construction season. And um, Right now, the fund has $183,000 in it, and the fund can only be used for things related to outside details. So if we do nothing, we're gonna anticipate next year, we're gonna have $283,000. So my, my, what I'm asking the board for is to um, uh, consider a motion to purchase two vehicles, which would be two pickup trucks, and they would use them for details. Uh, the pickup trucks are very universal, a lot of utility, uh, you use them for old home day for bringing cones out and things up and so forth. And uh, um, it's a little bit less expensive to outfit them with equipment than it is a car. You don't have to be putting the cages in it and you, you, know, you, you can save on some light packages uh, and, and, and different equipment. Um, one of the problems we're running into is the same thing that the gentleman before me spoke about is because all of the major manufacturers of vehicles had to retool for ventilators and that the police vehicles um, that they have in line with their domestic um, orders uh, has been interrupted and there's a shortage of police vehicles. So these aren't even police vehicles, these are just standard pickup trucks. But again, even these standard pickup trucks have been delayed and we can only find one now, but. Uh, because I wanted to know if we could find them. So we've got one that we've located and we're working on a second one. So um, the motion would be to approve the expenditure of up to $80,000, uh, up to 40 for each vehicle. Uh, and it would come from the Public Safety Revolving Fund, which is a separate enterprise account that can only be used for uh, uh, things related to outside details. Um, and for clarification, you know, somebody listening to this for the first time, uh, the fund accumulates from year to year. It was, um, I gave you backup documents. Uh, in the, it talks about the deliberative session in 2006, February 4th. Um, will not be part of the general surplus, may only be expended for public safety service details. That was the discussion under RSA 3195H. The Warren article, um, P29, was same thing, um, and uh, the all revenues will be deposited into this fund and may only be expended for public safety services. And then, then you have the statute, which is very specific about um, that it's to be used with special events, highway construction, or other construction projects. The last line confuses me, um, so I won't get into the last line. Um, <laughs> And then, and then it talks below, and I highlighted this for you, is um, you know, if the purpose is listed in paragraph one, um, you know, it talks about all of the 
the ins and outs where you pay, you know, the fees, the charges, and you pay expenses, and you get revenue, uh, and they accumulate year to year, and shall not be part of the town's general surplus. This is a separate fund. Um, such funds may only be expended for the purposes for which the fund was created. There's very limited circumstances that you can use this. However, you can buy vehicles because they'll be used for outside details. Uh, there's going to be a subsequent uh, motion that I'll ask you to, uh, to also um, authorize the expenditure of up to $20,000 for um, uniforms for the full-time and part-time offices. What, when I came to the board originally, and we talked about this conceptually and we created the program, um, I mean, who knew that it would be this successful that last year we did $311,000 in revenue and so that the leftover remaining portion was $90,000. So like I said, if we do nothing next year, we're going to have $270,000 in there. We're going to be back here going, okay, what can we spend it on? Well, the answer is you can only spend it on things related to outside details. We have a need for two more cars for the outside detail, which will bring in more money. And the uniform issue is when I proposed this, um, I knew that you'd have to see this work before you understood it because sometimes you just have to, you know, um, you know, believe it to see it. So we said that it would be at no cost. These people that come on the nine part-timers would bring their own equipment and their own gun, and uh, and it wouldn't. We wouldn't supply them with anything. But but here's here where we're at now. We have people that look differently out there at the sites because they're bringing a yellow shirt from this place and a yellow shirt from this place, and they're mismatched and so forth. If we buy them equipment that's a yellow shirt that says Plastow Police on it, long sleeve, short sleeve, we can require them to wear it. And then we can have uniformity, which is the whole purpose of a uniform. And we can make sure that they have the Nitzer uh, OSHA approved shirt so that if something happened that they had the right shirt on. Uh, we also, one thing that we overlooked was is these outside detail offices get called for other, other things other than construction. Um, recently, they were called up to uh, Hampstead Area Hospital, Hampstead uh, Hospital, to work a security detail overnight. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, the part-timers don't have a plastic uniform. They're showing up with construction detail, uh, and they wanted a cruiser, too. So they, they took a cruiser, but they went up there like they were going to direct traffic, but they're inside of a, <laughs> of, of a hospital. So, so we need to get them with a police department um, short sleeve shirt, a long sleeve shirt, or whatever jacket to do that. And this fund, that's part of this fund here that can do that. So um, I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions. I see one, well, one hand up now. It's kind of a detail. Looking at the original Warren article, P29, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that formed this fund, and it's, it's calling it the public safety service details. Mm -hmm. And it also says police and fire, so it could also be for, for and we teaser from the fire department. Oh, right? and we do use it. When yeah. there are okay. fire department details, it comes out of there. So let me let me. So just here's my question before you okay. go further. What I'm really asking is, at the beginning of the memo, you're calling it the public safety revolving fund, mm -hmm. but yet, according to the Warren article, it's the public safety service details fund. I can answer that. So if you turn to the RSA that I have on the last page. Okay. So it's under, you'll see at the top, it says 3195H revolving funds. Okay. A subcategory 1C says providing safety service, public safety services. So if you go back to the minutes of what um, uh, former selectman John, uh, Sherman. Um, John Sherman said, um, I believe it was him. Let's see. Yeah, he made the motion. He, well, down below it says motion by John Sherman and the article was seconded. Yeah. Presentation given by he motioned to accept an amended article replacing the word services at the end of the article with the word service details. Right. This was seconded by Martha Sumner. He explained the reason for the word changing, yep. and it was accepted. It's semantics. You go back to the statute. The statute says revolving fund, mm -hmm. and in, in the subcategory of 1C, it talks about public safety services. It's semantics. We're talking about outside details, yes. but it's a revolving fund. It's outside details. Just to give you a brief update on how we use this, I came to the board, and you bought cruisers previously, and you paid the general fund, and you paid them what you thought the va value of that vehicle was, not what you would get at auction. So you got your value, and the money's put in the general fund. We also, when the fire department had car two that, with no notice, 
didn't pass inspection, they need another car, I went to the police and said, can you free up a vehicle, give it to them? He did, and then we sent it out for a paint. And, yep. and yep. that was paid for, yep. the paint was paid for out of the uh, outside detail fund, because I came to you and asked you, because that's right. a purpose. Because that will be used for fire department outside details when they have them. So fire department personnel can drive the police vehicle? No. No, they have oh. their own fire vehicle. But it's not purchased via the this what? public safety fund. If it's being used, let's say, let's say EMTs had to go to a hospital for the public safety like you were describing, let's say up to one of the hospitals because there's something that happened. Right. Then they would use a fire, fire vehicle, but that fire vehicle is being used fire essentially detail, like a detail. A fire detail. It's like there. a fire detail in that case, so. Right. So Would that be covered here? I know it's not your request okay. right now. So let me just tell you that they do the equivalent of $3,000 worth of fire details in a year. Right. 3000 That's That's a fact. So you divide that up. It's not many details they have. We really can't substantiate a buying a vehicle. What we did was we know that there will be some use of a vehicle. So we can't, I came to the board and said, can you paint this vehicle and use the funds from that fund? Right. And that was, uh, I don't know, say $2,500 or $3,000, and we painted that vehicle. We solved a lot of problems. The, ve the police department lost a vehicle. The mm -hmm. fire department gained a vehicle. We paid for it out of the outside detail funds, okay? It was, no, it was a net zero to the taxpayers, but we have a fire department that has a vehicle, a second right. vehicle that they need. Right. right, but the answer is a, a fire department personnel couldn't use one of these pickups to... to no, they yeah. would use right. the fire vehicle because okay. the fire vehicle okay, is, it. in essence, their outside detail vehicle. And to reiterate, this is not taxpayer funded, so everybody yeah. needs to really clearly understand that. Go ahead, Greg. So I'm all for um, collecting this money and putting it to good use where, where this process makes sense. It sounds like we are making a lot more than we ever, ever expected, and we're now we're going to purchase two additional vehicles, and we're going to generate more money. And it doesn't appear that there is a need from the, for the details that we're gonna have the need for a, a lot of revenue. So why are we expanding this even further? We are gonna have you're, you're well. I mean, you're well into making a tremendous amount of profit from what we currently have, and now we're gonna purchase two more vehicles and be able to handle more details, yeah. which will mean more money bring, is brought into this process. Is there a need that we're trying to address this? Because I think what to? you're asking is, where is this going down the road? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a fund that is going to keep on sustaining itself. One of the things, one of the offsets is, is we could not go up on our outside detail rate in the future and make it affordable. Okay. The other thing is, is if you remember, the model was before that we didn't have enough people to cover the details in town and we were importing in everybody else to Plastow. They were then billing the contract to direct and the revenue was going to them. We swapped that around, the revenue staying here. Yep. Um, I don't consider it a problem that we're gonna have revenue that we can sustain our program and offset our operational budget. There's a hidden thing that happens here that is in compliance with the law. The hidden part is, is when this $20,000 to outfit the full-timers and part-timers, in the operational budget of the police department, uniforms, there's also a line yeah. item for uniforms. uniforms right. If we pay for, because full-timers work details too. So we can then look at that and say, can we reduce that number down on the operation side? Because right now, if you think about it, the uniforms that you're buying from the operation side, it's being used for outside detail. We don't want that to happen. We want to kind of make it a 50-50 a a or... correctly. Yeah. Right. So, and then the other thing is, is in my memo, I said, we're going to, I'm going to come back. Greg and I are doing an analysis now on the administrative costs. We don't think that we picked up all of the administrative costs. Oh. They, no. We, we don't think that we paid some portions of FICAR. We don't think that we paid some portions of administrative time over at the police department for everybody that touches a detail. And with more details, there's going to be more administrative costs. So there will be a reimbursement for those costs to the operation side of the, of the budget. Um, I, I get your point, but, you know, I guess it's a question, do we like what we have now for a model that 
we can sustain working the details with our people in our town, or do we want to go back to a model where everybody comes into Plastow and works details in Plastow, that's and not, then the money goes out of town? That's not what I said. Mark. No, 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 no. But it was at this current level. We continue supporting this current level. We are now well into the black. And if in a few years we have a half a million dollars in this fund and we still can't find ways of spending it or very minimal ways of spending it, have we grown it too big? I think right now it is really fulfilling the purpose. It is basically taking care of the vast majority of um, details with Plasto Police and it has taken care of the cost of doing that. So well, could, could it I just like there's some really, really minor other things that we can actually take care of that are inside of the regular police force, unless this gets so big that we need to hire an administrator for the outside details. Could so, I just interrupt sure. for a second? Because I, we are going to be needing a significant amount of details once this water project gets going and they start digging up the streets. Yeah. We're going to need a significant amount of details. And I know that's sort of a short term, maybe two to five year fix on it. But as Mark said, a lot of the operating budget can be reduced and offset by using this particular fund, which takes it off the backs of the taxpayers. And as he said, it, it, if it starts to get a little bit too large or too unwieldy, um, they can maintain a particular um, cost for it. And so, um, and it's not like we have to use it like impact fees where you have to use this money within a certain time frame. So um, my thought is anything that we can do to, to maintain those funds that doesn't hit the taxpayers that will help to offset our budget expenses is definitely worthwhile. I know where you're coming from. I know you're gonna say, well, this could grow to a million dollars, but I, I don't think it's gonna get to that point. There are other offsets to it that we can do. And, um, you know, and we can even outsource people, too, if we have to. So one of the things that I would like to respond is that there's a need for more vehicles because we're exceeding our six. And when we exceed our six, we're now dipping into the operation vehicles. And that's not what we're trying to avoid, is to use taxpayer vehicles out at an outside detail. Because the longevity of that car we don't want out there um, doing that. So we, we, we and then there's, there's some ancillary benefits here. Within this, when we have old home day, what we used to do is, is we used to pay everybody from the operational budget over time and mandate that they be there. This outside detail fund can pay every officer that you have at that old home day and not charge the taxpayers for, and we can pay it out of the outside detail fund. Not so, just police. So we can do it. Right? What's that? Not just police, right? Not just police, we can do fire too. Right. So we can, we, for instance, if the construction contracts for the water have 600 hours of uh, traffic control in it, but we need 1,000, that 400 hours can be paid out of this fund. Okay. So there's- As long as you can find a way of spending it. Though. Well, that's why I'm here tonight to spend it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm fine. Okay. But I just wanted to, make, wanted to make sure that we were not building up a revenue source that we didn't have a need for. If you're saying that we do have a need for this and there are creative ways we can utilize this to offset the budget, I'm all for it. I'm absolutely all for it. And I'm all, and I'm 100% for these two motions. Uh, I just was looking at this and saying, really I, I, I never thought in my career would actually be saying, well, what happens if we make too much money here <laughs> and then there's not going to be a problem? Well, you will never hear it again. <laughs> Go ahead, Julian. First of all, this service is a need to the community, even though it's a detail, because without the details, it hinders public safety. That's why they have these details. The sec I just want to make sure that we have enough parking lot space to start collecting all these vehicles we're getting so we don't have to have a public safety service vehicle parking lot. Well, the, by adding these two, we would bring the sum zero to the same amount that happened before, before, before details, because we reduced down the operational fleet and increased the detail fleet. So when you look at the cars parked behind the station, the it's gonna be about 50-50, and so 50% are on the taxpayers instead of 100%, yeah. and 50% are outside detail. And then when there's an emergency, don't make no mistake about it, all hands on deck, and they will grab whatever vehicle, and if it's an emergency and it's 24 hours, they will take outside detail, yeah 
vice versa. If there is a crash on a, on, a, on a vehicle that gets taken out of service that's a front line, they will Back have vehicle. another vehicle to take. So it is a ebb and flow. Right now the ebb and flow is, is they're using a operation vehicle for the details, and that's yep. what we're trying to avoid. And I think what will happen is a good thing is going in the positive direction, never a negative direction. Never. Unlike it was when I started, where the taxpayers were subsidizing the details. Right. Now they're not. Jay, did you have a question or a comment? Similar to Old Home Day, are there other events that mm -hmm. we would utilize this for? So, for like, instance, uh, graduation or you absolutely. Know, stuff like that. All I would need is the municipal board to say um, to us or give us direction or consensus mm -hmm. about. Uh, graduation at the high school, they need a police detail, detail need pay it out of the outside detail, detail fund. Yeah. So you can you can determine because the statute says that the municipal officials can can do that. Um, I don't want to get into a gray area though. I don't want to try to do anything to subplant the operational budget. Correct. I want to make sure this passes muster in the in the, in the light of day. But uh, for instance, you've got a road race coming up. Uh, that, that, that somebody has asked and I forwarded to you. Yeah. If you decided that you wanted to have details for that outside, de outside road race and you said, we don't want to charge this person with six details for that day, take it out of the outside detail fund, you can do that. Mm -hmm. the, the problem might be is you're going to get everybody that wants you to pay for the details for their event. So you're going to have to balance that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. If it's a non-profit type yeah. event. You have, whatever, the yeah. you have the run for the savages. Yeah. If you say that that's what you want, to, you want the so that the Run for Savages can raise more money for their donation, and yeah. you want to use this fund to pay for the outside details for the Run for Savages, mm -hmm. you can do that. It's a good use for it. It's, yeah. a, it's right. a great use and, the, and that's something that we, is on our agenda for the 27th, the, the Run of the Savages and, and Ms. Moore's um, yes, request. Yes, I gave you a heads up because yeah, she so just Yeah, so we're going to put that on the agenda for the 27th because oh, we done. have too much stuff tonight. Yeah, so. six feet apart. Pardon, John? <laughs> oh, no, nothing. Okay. All right. So, um, motion on the floor to authorize up to eighty thousand dollars for the expenditure of police vehicles. Do you have something written there? For yeah. Us? Yes, it's right there. It's all proposed right. motion. Is it? All right. Two. Make a motion that we authorize the expenditure of up to eighty thousand dollars from the Plasco Public Safety Revolving Fund for the purchase of two pickup trucks for the outside detail use and to further authorize any and all related expenses and maintenance of these vehicles from the same fund. Right. I'll second it. Okay, seconded by Julian. If there's no more for, further discussion, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? All right, that motion carries 500. And would I'm, someone like to make a motion do the to second? authorize the expenditure of up to $20,000 from the Plasta Public Safety Revolving Fund for the purchase of uniforms and gear related to performing outside details for the full-time and part-time officers. Motion. All right. Um, no, if there's no further discussion, um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. That motion carries 5-0-0 as well. So. So we're going to table those two race requests. Yeah, I put that the on the agenda meeting. for okay. the 27th, Jay, because we just can't fit one more thing in here, and I kept getting requests for all this additional stuff. So, and you guys have been working since five this afternoon, so I'm going to try to have mercy on you. Do you want me to do my town manager's report no, real quick? Absolutely not. No. Thank Why you, do I do no. it then? Thank it. you, but no, we got it. We got it. <laughs> and well, you, should, you should have got an updated one too, because I did update it today. So all right. you should have got an updated one. I, I usually like a quick summary of it. I, I know, but. Public doesn't I'm, get to read it. I know that, but I'm going to overrule you because we're going to be here till midnight. So um, if there's any questions that you have for Mark or for our next meeting, feel free to, to write them down and I'm ask him. But um, what I would like to do is enter into non-public session to discuss um, several personnel issues. So um, there, I'll just let the general public know that we are going into non-public and there will be no televised uh, meetings after this, so I'm going to adjourn our meeting at 9.07 p.m. So good night, everyone. And we will be going into non public, and I'd like don't to have, have to make, don't a we motion. Have to make the motion yeah. while we're in public session? Um, yes, we do. So, yes, so go ahead. Sorry. We're not ended yet. All right, we're almost I'll make a motion it. that we <laughs> enter the non public session under RSA 91 A, colon 3 2. Um, is it C reputation? No, no, no. It's um, per employee personnel. personnel. Employee personnel, which is what? hiring public employee. Which one? 
Um, I think it is public employee. Public employee, A. 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 Which is it, A? A. All right, so may I have a second on that, please? Can I second the motion? Thank you, John. Uh, may we have a roll call vote on that? Sorry. Yes. 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 All right. So we will now be going into non-public session, and our meeting will be adjourned at 9:10 p.m. Thank you. Good night, everybody. <laughs> is, is this on my value?